Well, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm the chair of, of COSA and it's great to welcome our, our colleagues and friends at BOEM and uh, I'm looking forward to a great day of, of discussion. Do you want to just zip around the room quickly with, with introductions? Uh, is that the, the best way to go, to jump right in? All right, please. Sorry. Uh, can you uh, press the button on the microphone to speak so everyone online can hear as well? Hello. <laughs> My name is Marina Shaji. I'm an economist at Bureau's Pacific Region in Environmental Sciences. Uh, Jessica Malandine, marine biologist with the Marine Minerals Program in the Gulf of Mexico. Victoria Brady, biologist with the Marine Minerals Program at headquarters. James Flynn, uh, atmospheric scientist at the University of Houston. Karen Ashton, biological oceanographer, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Katrin Eichen with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, benthic ecologist. Jack Barth, Oregon State University. I'm a coastal oceanographer. Hello, Megan Carr. I'm with the BOMES Office of Strategic Resources, background geology, environmental sciences, and geophysics. Hi, I'm John Jensen. I'm from the University of West Florida. Florida. I'm an applied historian and marine archaeologist. Deb Wixon, I'm with the National Academies Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. Jeff Weichel, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Good morning. Jessica Bravo, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Deputy Chief Environmental Officer. I'm Jonathan Tucker. I'm with the National Academy of Science, and I'm a, a program officer at the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. And I, I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm uh, the Dean of, of the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and I'm a fisheries oceanographer. Les Kaufman, Boston University Marine Program, and I'm a benthic ecologist, and I study coupled human natural systems. Jackie Dragon, Senior Oceans Campaigner with Greenpeace. And I'm Lori Suma, I'm retired from ExxonMobil, currently adjunct at Rice and UT, and I'm a geologist. Good morning, Dina Hansen with Boehm's Marine Minerals Program at headquarters. Hi, uh, Jeremy Firestone, University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy. I'm a social scientist and recovering lawyer. And my apologies, but I'm only going to be here for today. I have to go back for a, a family issue. Good morning, Anna Rice. I'm a physical scientist at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in the Marine Minerals Program, Gulf of Mexico region. Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Director of Institute of Marine Sciences, University of California, Santa Cruz, and a professor there study upper trophic level uh, critters like marine mammals and seabirds. Ruth Perry, I'm the head of regulatory affairs for renewable power at Shell, um, and I'm a PhD oceanographer uh, specializing in physical oceanography. <laughs> uh, Bill Brown, the chief environmental officer of BOM, zoologist lawyer. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rodney Cluck. I'm Chief of BOEM's Division of Environmental Sciences, uh, which also oversees BOEM's Environmental Studies Program, which we'll be talking a lot about at our summer COSA meetings. Uh, good morning, everybody. Jeff Reidenauer. I'm the uh, Chief of the Marine Minerals Division in BOEM, uh, part of the Office of uh, Strategic Resources at headquarters. Good morning, everyone. Shannon Cofield. I am a geological oceanographer with the Marine or BOEMS Marine Minerals Division. Paul Knorr, critical minerals specialist. I'm a somewhat interdisciplinary geologist. Wonderful. And and Zoe, we have Zoe in the back here who's keeping us all honest on line and online. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin St. Martin. I'm faculty in geography at Rutgers University. So I think I think Kevin's the only other COSA member online. Anyone else from, from BOEM online that can introduce themselves? Oh, there's about 50 people. Wow. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should add. Maybe we should just read the uh, read the participant list. <laughs> Um, 
Well, with that, what I'll do then, I'll hand it over to Bill to uh, make the the Boehm introductions, and uh, he can he can solve that problem of uh, the people online and how you want to introduce them all. <laughs> okay. And no, I'm fine e either way, but with a few housekeeping things, because there's a, it's a big meeting. So um, the, uh, uh, it, in our, in our, I mean, we can do it a couple of ways. I mean, raise your hands if you like, or, or tip your card up if you have a question or, or a comment. Make sure you use the microphones online. You could use the raise hand apps. Um, I'm from New Bedford, and so, so a lot of the meetings there are Robert's Rules of Order because Robert attended a fisheries meeting and then wrote those rules that he lived in. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so, uh, but I don't think we need to, to go down that road road here. Um, any other, uh, let's see, for other housekeeping, of course, the two bathrooms, I, I, we, we just I found those at, at the break. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to a, a, a great, great discussion. So we've had a, an hour closed meeting. So the COSA, the new members, we have several new members uh, uh, in, in the COSA group. And um uh, they've just kind of in introduced themselves a little bit, so we can we can move in and start the meeting uh, if if that's all right with everyone. Sounds good. So, um, on the on the agenda, it has the welcome bill. It has your welcome, and then uh, uh, Megan and and Jeff. Do you guys want to have a couple opening comments to to jump in? I know we have a. I know I have a, a Bone One Hundred and One thing for some yes. of the new members. Is that it? Is is? Yes. Uh, it, let Separate. me. I, I can. I, I. I'm happy to extemporaneously just say I, I think it's great to see everybody, uh, and um, some people I know that have been on the COSA for a long time, yeah. and uh, and others that are newly on that I've known for quite a while. Mm -hmm. I think since I've been here, and uh, I mean, and let me just say for the new members the. Uh, uh, I, I think the uh, National Academies of Science, uh, Engineering and Medicine is a really important institution for us and actually for the US government in general. Uh, I, and, and actually I'd love to see it engaged more, more broadly across the government. Um, uh, but, but, you know, BOEM is sort of heavily looking to the <laughs> academies and, for a lot of different kinds of things. Actually, I've got one slide where that Jessica put together that sort of shows a number of the projects. And so, I, I, uh, you know, your your task is I, it's really important to us. It's to you know to uh, we didn't pick you. Uh, you're uh, you're picked by an institution that you know cares about its uh, integrity and independence and and uh, intellectual strength too. And and. Uh, so, you know, we, we really value the time you're giving us free of charge. And um, uh, so that's very special. And, and, and we're focusing on marine minerals here, which is just a really fascinating, important area. Uh, and uh, uh, Megan Carr is the leader of the group, uh, but there are many leaders within it. And, and um, uh, you know, it's just, uh, there's a lot going on and you know, some of it's been going on for a long time and some, you know, like for sand, but the whole critical mineral issue is just really just, you know, hugely significant coming up now and they're very focused on it. So, uh, so it should be a really interesting discussion. Um, that's my welcome. Fantastic. Thank you, Megan. No, thanks. And just want to say thank you for having all of us here. It's something that's really important, you know, we talk about our bone mission all the time and, and how at the root of all of our decision is good science. And so that's where I see a lot of value in the people that are across this room, not able to join us here today and, and everyone that's on the screen as well is how can we come together and make sure that the science that we're doing, particularly because it is paid for by tax dollars, is the best that it can be and orchestrated and building those partnerships and particularly in our very late coming fiscal year 24 appropriations um, from Congress, thanks for the, the late notice, 
every year it gets later and later, um, it makes it more difficult or a challenge to execute those funds. And so like really having as much work up front, having these conversations, designing good projects, having things shovel ready for whenever um, it's time to execute is, is really important. And these conversations really bring um, that into focus as, as best as possible. And it contributes towards that. So I wanna thank you for everyone preemptively for the next couple of days. Um, mentioned with the budget, um, our program, the Marine Minerals program has grown very significantly over the last several years. We're becoming more and more involved um, and you'll see on the different slide presentations throughout this two days how that has evolved, but really focusing on how we can support the offshore wind program within our bureau and the development of their construction and operation plans, those reviews, making sure that we're brought into those processes to look at where those different cable and other transmission corridors are being proposed and that it doesn't compromise other resources and other ocean uses as much as possible. So that's a real big um, development over the last several years as that industry has started to take off pretty significantly um, in addition to um, the charge. And I was just saying earlier today, critical minerals, huge. It's becoming a bigger and bigger space for us. Um, so our partnerships with NOAA, with USGS and others, uh, the State Department, Department of Defense, just um, Department of Energy, um, this group right here, everyone that's able to come into the conversation, very, very um, welcomed um, and, and something that we want to see continue. So just with that, I don't want to steal the thunder that everyone's put together the presentations today, but just issuing that thanks. Jeff. Sure, <clears throat> thanks. Yeah, hi again, everybody. Uh, I just want to say that this is a great venue. I was uh, wondering what it was going to look like uh, this first time I've been here. Uh, a lot different than the uh, DC venue. Uh, I, if I had my druthers, this would be where I'd like to have a meeting. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, thanks for the opportunity to, to really kind of dig deep into the Marine Minerals Program during the next uh, couple of days. Uh, what I, I really value the, the, the diversity of the COSA with respect to uh, the Marine Minerals Program. We've been participating uh, in the COSA meetings ever since the beginning. Uh, and like Megan said, we, you know, we've been growing over the last few years in terms of staff budget and responsibilities. So it's nice to have different perspectives from everybody uh, to weigh in on uh, you know, where we're going, what, what kind of science we're doing, if we're doing good science. And uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity and y'all's time. So thanks. Great, thank you. Well, and, and, and in, our, in our meeting and in our introduction to um, with, the, with the new members, I, you know, we went through the, the, the tasks of COSA and really the, the main one is to, to, to facilitate, to try and provide expertise or, or provide the network to connect up to other, other scientists. And so over the next couple of days, I, I really uh, encourage everyone to, to, to meet each other, to talk. And, and to form those connections because a lot of uh, where we don't write a formal report, instead what we do is we, we provide advice, we provide, uh, try and review and connections and then also um, interactions where, um, uh, you know, someone might say, well, I, I, I need this particular bit of expertise and reach out to one particular member in COSA. So the, 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 the membership connection and the connection between the the BOEM uh, staff and scientists and the uh, and the COSA members is very important and please don't you know build on that and use that so so great well with with that um, is there any other housekeeping we need to do or shall we we jump in good yeah. all, all right well then Bill we'll uh, we'll turn it over to you for your your 101 Somebody actually put the slides up. Uh, yeah, and so this this is uh, this will be a brief uh, overview. I, uh, it shouldn't take too long, and I'm, I've uh, we've tried to put it together so that it would it would be helpful to uh, particularly to the COSA members that that may really not have much of a feel for what the Bureau actually actually does. And I apologize to those of you like, uh, like Ruth that have followed us for, you know, 
it's a long time. And so if it's redundant, uh, I won't dwell on the details. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there we have a mission uh, to manage the development of the Outer Continental Shelf energy and minerals uh, and geological resources. That's our sort of reference for carbon sequestration uh, in an environmentally and economically responsible way. We now calculate the acreage as 3.2 billion uh, uh, and Megan's office does that. They do the mapping for the Bureau. And, and that 3.2 includes the territories that have were added uh, by Congress. And there's a picture of, of where they are. And also see the darker kind of red stuff. That's uh, the area that the State Department recently declared as the extended outer continental shelf. So it's the, the area that's beyond uh, 200 nautical miles. And uh, not every nation in the world agrees with us on that point, you may have noticed. Uh, next slide. Uh, th this, is, this is the department. Uh, the president should be at the top. The interior secretary reports to the president. And uh, so, you know, we have a deputy a director, deputy director, and then we have this, uh, these six boxes underneath, three regional directors, uh, a, uh, uh, our uh, renewable energy chief who's essentially managing uh, an Atlantic region, although we can't declare that yet. Uh, and, and Megan's the chief of the Office of Strategic Resources there, for example. Uh, the next slide. And I'm not gonna read all these things, but we have, oh, let me just set it up there for a minute and kind of basic important tasks that are out of our strategic framework. And we do have, it's online now. I recommend you take a look at it. Just a few months ago, we posted a, uh, a, an updated strategic uh, framework. We're not calling it a strategic plan, pretending that we've really got the operational details down to that level. Uh, next slide. So uh, I'm sure you've been reading about and you've been hearing about all of what we're doing on renewable energy, which really translates to uh, wind uh, at, at the moment, fundamentally. And next slide. And I, I, this is just to give you a sense of the scale. I believe, you know, we've tried to make this up to date. It's hard to keep this slide completely up to date. And I believe actually, for example, I read this morning, we would approved our eighth with New England wind, our eighth record of decision. Although one, one of the projects has dropped out, but um, Huge amount of activity, too small to actually read the details unless your eyes are better than mine. But basically the, the, uh, the East Coast is uh, in the, in the, on the North side is ahead of the rest, a lot of projects. Uh, uh, the West Coast is moving along. Uh, we, and we're working on uh, potential future lease sales for the Mid-Atlantic and a sec a, a, what will be a second sale for the Gulf of Mexico, a sale for Oregon, a sale for the Gulf of Maine, uh, all, all in this year uh, in the works. Next slide. And uh, so we, you know, in, in, historically the Bureau and going back to the MMS days was really, really known for its management of of oil and gas offshore and particularly almost entirely the Gulf of Mexico. We do have a, a new national program that's been issued um, and, and Megan's uh, office is responsible for that among many other things. And, uh, and as, you, as you can see, the, the period is 2024 to 2029 and their next slide there, there are just three uh, lease sales contemplated. We don't necessarily have to do them, but we said that's what we in, intend to do. Uh, and they're in those years, 2025, 2027, 2029. And as you can see, they're, 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 lim they're restricted to the Western and Central Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. Oh, and let me say one thing, just to notice on the slides, uh, part of the background of that is 
uh, the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, allows offshore wind lease sales only if in the previous 12 months there's been an oil and gas lease sale covering at least 60 million acres, one or more covering at least that amount. So, so that was uh, let's say that that was a legislative uh, uh, um, uh, initiative decided to give uh, uh, those who want to have off offshore wind lease sales uh, uh, also do something for oil and gas. It's built into the statute. Next slide. Uh, the Marine Minerals Program. Just take a look. You've got you've got you know all the experts here, and they've got a lot to bring on. So I'm not going to read the slide to you, but this is their slide, and it basically lays out uh, you know kind of fundamentals for why this matters. Next slide. And we and we do have this new uh, requirement that was in the. Uh, uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act uh, bill. When I first heard that, I kept hearing bill and I was had a hard time. People were calling me to respond or whatever, you know, but that kind of adapted to that now. Uh, and actually the statute uh, uh, directed, directs the secretary to issue uh, uh, regulations for leasing for carbon sequestration within a year after November 15th, 2020. One, so we we have passed that date, and um, but that doesn't mean that the whole bureau isn't working like really hard on it. It's and and I, I suppose maybe at least my excuse would be that from the beginning the bureau decided to approach this not just as a uh, as a framework regulation but as a program, uh, uh, and so there's been a whole lot of work. Uh, 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 heavily in the Gulf and making an office that's been very involved and my office has been too to try to develop a program that the regulations actually you know are based on and drawn into and so we have a very large package that's out there and I cannot give you a deadline but we're working hard on it and and of course as you know a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, companies that are generating CO2 are really uh, uh, banking on, on sequestration being significant. And, and so there's a lot at stake in trying to make sure that works right. So Bill, uh, I'll just interrupt real quick on this note, um, the latest greatest um, timing that we've been authorized to say is this fall is whenever the proposed rulemaking will be out for public comment. Um, we seem to be on track for that. So I can say that some level of certainty. Um, so we are a little bit past the deadline, but with every question that we answer, we get another 10 to 20. So it's um, very robust um, and it's makeup very bulky, um, so to speak. But um, I do think that, that this as a whole, how the program is developing would be a very good topic for a COSA meeting, um, say some point early 2025 as we're working through the comments that we get from the um, public comment period and we're designing what we're gonna do, particularly for the environmental monitoring piece is gonna be really critical that, that we're doing that the right way so that these projects don't end up um, having unintended consequences right from the beginning. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I hope we can live up to what we said we're gonna do in terms of timing. Um, uh, Next slide. Uh, we have we've have completed some rulemakings. The, uh, the split rule, which uh, uh, for the first time actually uh, assigns BSEE regulatory res responsibility for inspection and enforcement of, of uh, the offshore wind activities. And until that rule was issued, BOEM was actually uh, uh, the agency in charge of it all, really without the capability to do enforcement, for example, at this point. So, so Bessie's there. And I mean, if sure you get a feel for it, though, they're, they've really step, been stepping up, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a huge shift for them from not really being responsible to being now responsible for inspection and enforcement. Uh, and then we did gain the territorial jurisdiction. And I think, uh, uh, to me, at least, it's clear it's all the U.S. territories, although there's a mandate to move forward uh, uh, with wind uh, lease sale feasibility and then the exercise of that requirement for the five 
uh, U.S. territories that have uh, 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 civilian governments and populations, uh, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, and then Northern Mariana. And so they were, we're focusing on them. Uh, we have a proposed rule that uh, ready to go final to, uh, to quote, modernize. The streamline was actually the earlier word, but we've we focused on modernizing uh, uh, offshore wind. And it's, I mean, most of that really is, is just uh, trying to make some of the terms that are used in the current rules a little bit more efficient. Uh, there's a risk management rule, which I will not try to explain. If somebody else here wants to, they can. Um, <clears throat> there's a protection of marine archeological resources rule that's also ready to go final. And actually its fundamental thing was to clarify that BOEM has the authority to require a survey uh, uh, of an area before it gets drilled. And it, it was, uh, that had been a practice for a long time, but our lawyers brought it into question. It's not an offshore wind issue. It's, it's limited to oil and gas. And this rule would clarify that. It's the fundamental thing. Uh, and then uh, as Megan said, there's a proposal and development where I guess I, I'll say too, I guess we're looking to later in this year uh, um, for a proposal. I'll also add, um, and it's in our regulatory agenda, um, a fitness to operate is another um, rulemaking that we're moving forward with. And so this is primarily for oil and gas type of operators and lessees, um, but then it, there's potential for it to be expanded to all other um, type of ocean uses that we authorize as well. But we're initially starting with oil and gas. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so here's the environmental program. And of course now I, I, uh, that's what we're looking to the COSA to help advise us on. But it relates to everything I just described. Uh, uh, but I will make the point though, it's not just the studies program, although that's critically important. It's, it's the whole environmental program that we, we want your help on. And so it's uh, the assessment side as well. And, and uh, our assessment side has a lot of, we employ a lot of scientists who are not in the science division. And if I, if I refer to the science division as the division that have sciences and headquarters, it properly upsets people because there are a lot of scientists uh, you know, who, who aren't in that division, as important as that division is. Um, so, I mean, there's a basic thing of what we do. Next slide. Uh, Long-term goals, uh, the a, a fundamental thing is to be first in class, second to none, call it what you want. Maybe second to none is less, uh, shows less hubris. <laughs> and uh, some people like to use best in class, but that sounds like the dog show. So we went with first in class. <laughs> and, and uh, so I, I, we're serious about that. And as some of you know, that the, the COSA members, we, we did uh, uh, pay for uh, an academy consensus committee and report that did a really good job, I think, and 18 attributes. And, and, uh, and we have uh, a very talented staff that are working on ways to move that forward. And, and, I, and actually, I believe the COSA's oversight of how we're doing on that, and I don't mean you're our overseers in a regulatory way of what we do, but you're paying attention, <clears throat> scolding us if necessary, helping us through is important, I think. Um, uh, and but then under that, uh, uh, you know, we've listed the broad category of protecting ecosystems in the context of, of climate change. And uh, I'll, I think there's one other slide that particularly to show related to that, but that's a huge area, right? So that's, I mean, that's kind of the fundamental, a fundamental and historical mission. Uh, but, we, but we have listed separately uh, tribes and environmental justice. And uh, I mean, it's certainly a priority of this administration, but it's been a priority of mine uh, uh, for, uh, before and during the Trump administration as well, when it was much less highlighted. Um, and uh, uh, it, I, in some ways, you know, there, there are, 
there are uh, uh, stated and important policies of the White House and the Interior Department that are uh, pretty specific, that with federally recognized tribes, uh, we should consult early and often on anything they're interested in. We should try to make sure that we make them aware of that. If they're interested, we should do our best to seek consensus and in a real way. Uh, and if we fail to reach consensus, we don't have to, you know, it's not mandated that we have an agreement and we have a duty to be as clear as we can. Uh, you know, that, why, that if we're not doing something that we are not doing it and explain why and maybe hope to work things out more, but to be clear. Uh, uh, and then beyond the consultation requirement, uh, there's an underlying more fundamental trust responsibility of the United States government that's, you know, dates back to our constitution uh, and uh, you know, treaties with tribes that are uh, uh, date back actually before the constitution. The first written treaty was 1778, the Fort Pitt Treaty. Uh, and, um, uh, and then there were early Supreme Court decisions of uh, 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 of Justice Marshall, the chief, second Chief Justice in the United States that really helped define uh, 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 the sovereign status of tribes. It's a, it is a uh, dependent sovereignty. It, is a, you know, it recognizes the overarching authority of the, of the Constitution. And a lot of what people don't, I think, always immediately understand if they haven't gotten into it is that there's a lot of, a lot of that background relates to the tribes their right and their interest in working directly with the federal government and not going through state governments. So it's, and it's a really, so we're doing the best we can. We're hot, we've hired a wonderful tribal liaison officer who's a Pomo Indian and she's a lawyer. She was the chief judge of the Yakima and she's uh, uh, really focused on our trust responsibility. Uh, and she's been trying to actually help some of the companies figure out what to, how to work with the uh, tribes better. Uh, and then on environmental justice, where that's just, as you may have noticed, this is also a a, a, a priority of the Biden administration, uh, uh, and certainly the Interior Department, and and uh, I, and and we're doing a lot on it. And Jessica Bravo, who's here, is actually I th I think the person who knows all the bits and pieces of that the best. But we've we've focused on uh, New York Bite. Uh, 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 and forums for environmental justice and a contract that we just have results from for best practices and so forth. And, and we're, in, we're in the stage now of trying to expand that to, so that it's, you know, it's not just the New York Bite project and, and not really just my own office that have, you know, that's doing most of the work and to spread it across, across BOEM. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's uh, environmental leadership. Uh, um, the uh, so there's the the headquarters side of the equation is on the left there, uh, but we have a we have a diversified uh, 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 environmental program, diversified staff. So that if you look at the box on the right, there you know for the Gulf of Mexico, the Pacific, Alaska, renewable energy, I mean marine minerals. Each each of those program areas has environmental staff uh, that do, and, and they're organized in different ways, but they, uh, when you put it together, they, there are some that are focused on studies more and, and, and others largely that are uh, probably the larger share of focus, focus more on taking science and doing assessment work. So that's our basic current structure. Next slide. Uh, so we've got all these things going with the National Academy. Um, uh, we have two standing committees. There's COSA. There's also an offshore wind and fisheries committee, which really was driven by the uh, offshore wind uh, 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 releases and projects. Uh, we have consensus studies that we're supporting. Um, one, we were, I, I think probably the first financial sponsor, I'm not sure if we were, were but I think we might've been of uh, increasing diversity in the ocean studies community. And 
uh, that's now been launched. It's supposed to last two years. Uh, that we've done, we've had, for example, funded uh, a study on hydrodynamic impacts of wind on Nantucket Shoals, an important study. And then we have the attributes of the first in class program. That was a letter report for those of you. So it's a you know, simpler thing and cheaper too. Um, we've done at least one formal peer review. What we're doing here for what it's worth, and this is maybe the, to note to the new COSA members, this is not peer review, this meeting. The kinds of our discussions with COSA, are very important it's feedback for us and op, op, open to the public, but, it, but it, it, it's not peer review. We never contemplate, we never contemplated it should be. And I, I make a point of this because some of the COSA members in the past have expressed concern that, that, uh, that it might be perceived as that. And it's not. If you want peer review from the National Academies, you have to pony up around 150,000. And they've put together a big project just on that. And it's very detailed and very good. And we did want, we've done one on air quality modeling in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, and we actually have a, uh, our, our uh, default approach is that if something is highly influential, like a study, uh, you know, a, a rare study, that, that's the, that those are the ones that we would typically use the academies for. But to date, it's just been this one. Uh, and then we have a workshop. We, we've sponsored several workshops, you know, which don't have a consensus report. There's a workshop report from them and uh, there's one they're listed. So there's a lot, there's a whole portfolio of, of functions that, that are funded under a, a, an IDIQ, an umbrella contract that we have. So the individual projects are, are task orders. Next slide. Uh, the studies program uh, mission there is pretty fundamental. Rodney is the head of it. Um, next slide. Uh, serves everybody. I mean, that's, <laughs> I can, I should actually let Rodney do this part, but I'm, I'm going to do it all to so let Megan actually do the, the other part. But, uh, but Rodney is very good at always making the point that it's, this is not like a little headquarters, uh, you know, little pointy headed thing. It's, it's serving everybody. And actually the funding develops that way. It goes through a quite uh, elaborate process. It was authorized by, by section 20 of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act over a billion dollars and a quarter to date. Although, you know, we need, uh, we do need money to keep uh, increasing that. And of course, I'm not seeking that, but um, uh, it is a tight budget time right now. Um, it has typically been about 30 million in annual funding. And the results are all available publicly, and we looked. We've looked to the COSA from the beginning to help us uh, try to make the process as good as we can make it, and and that's still an open invitation request. No process is perfect. Next slide. Uh, and then we have what we call assessment. It's kind of a mild way of dis of presenting the the regulatory program. But, but its its purpose is not just to assess impacts, but it's develop what people call mitigation measures and essentially regulatory measures. So, so there's, there's the information and there's what you do with it that actually affects outcomes. And uh, at the national level, uh, Jill Lewandowski is the, the head of, she was on that other slide, but she's the head of the national assessment program and also the head of the Center for Marine Acoustics. Next slide, which I think comes up, yeah. I actually like Jill's, when, when we launched, we launched initially the idea of having centers of expertise and the obvious one was, was uh, acoustics. I mean, we might do other things. No one was sure in the beginning, actually, if it would really work. Uh, you know, why have a center? Some people said, you know, you've got good staff. They can. The center really has, I think, brought focus to the, it, it's, I think it's doing what we had hoped. I credit Jill a lot to this, but she's now got a group of seven people, including herself, which is a lot of people that be focused on acoustics. And they're, they're very talented. They include modelers. They, they can, there's, you know, they're like as good as there is anybody good that's out there, including in the commercial sector. 
Uh, so there, as you can imagine, uh, they've been, they're critical in the offshore wind uh, uh, process uh, because when you pound turbines, monopoles, and it makes a fair amount of noise. And so there's a, a regulatory system that, that they've helped develop. And, and, um, and you know, and, and they, their objective is to be a trusted voice. They're not on this, on, they're on the side of the environment, but they're not on the side of industry or the EDNGOs. They're doing a government job to be a trusted voice. And Jill also always has said several times, if you're not driving the bus, you'll find yourself under it. So that's another reason for having a, a CMA. Next slide. Uh, th their functions, they're kind of generic. So I, I won't dwell on them. Take a quick look. Uh, next slide. Uh, just one thing to note, I, again, I'm not going to go into this, but the, the, there is a tremendous focus on the North Atlantic right whale, which is in dire straits, uh, largely because of vessels and, and uh, a certain fishing activity. But there's certainly a lot of concern about the impact of uh, wind farms too. Uh, some of it, I think, unfounded that the whales that have washed up lately really are related to that. Uh, but we, we recognize that's, that is a species of animal that we need to pay very special attention to. And so we have developed and published a strategy. Jill's been the, the leader on that for, for Bone uh, and Noah's our partner. Um, next slide. Uh, just to just take a look. I mean, this is just, this is like, this is real life in the Bone environmental program. You're surrounded by all these statutes uh, and, and uh, it's for every aspect. I mean, uh, Jeff Ridenhauer finds himself surrounded by these laws. Um, and we could list more. Those are just the most significant ones. Next slide. And this is just to show you, we really are trying to have a number of partners. So we're putting all of the logos up as our example of that. Um, uh, for example, the Environmental Studies Program is sort of prides itself on leveraging its funding uh, 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 very heavily through these other partnerships. Next slide. Uh, tribal. I talked. I talked longer than I intended to on tribes, so maybe I'll just <laughs> take a quick look and we'll go on. It really does. I mean, it matters to us, and we're trying to do everything we can to uh, live up to our trust responsibilities. Which, which historically the federal government really has not done. So we're trying to do better. Next slide. Next slide. I showed you this already. I already talked on it too. Uh, so uh, one thing I've been pushing this, I'm at the closing stage now. I think we're down to one or two, maybe three slides at most. But uh, I mean, it's apparent to me that Artificial intelligence is, is going to revolutionize so much of what goes on in the world, but it certainly will uh, affect what what Bohm does in a big way. And we should and we should uh, tr try to understand it and take advantage of it. And so this slide actually is uh, these are points uh, from a uh, uh, a YouTube video that. Uh, um, that uh, uh, Andre Carpathy, who's currently got his own company, but he was with OpenAI, and and before that he was the head of Tesla's uh, uh, AI program. But he he had a very influential YouTube video that various people picked up on, and and uh, and I sh I shared this and some other slides with our uh, strategic or uh, senior leadership team just to try to prompt everybody, and they were there, I think. Uh, to get more into AI, but these are some fundamental points he made, which I, uh, so, you know, they're not my points. I can't guarantee that all of this is, it's not vetted by the United States government, but it's worth noting because I think it's reasonable. And uh, so these, these uh, foundation models, basically large language models that can do more than handle text uh, uh, can either do these things or we'll be able to do them in the next few years, that's his term, let's say certainly before 2030, uh, 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 read and generate text, no more than a human can about a subject, browse the internet. 
use existing software infrastructure and you know and mentioning keyboard mouse calculator but 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 the point is that anything you can think of yourself doing on a computer it can or will be able to do uh see and generate images hear seek and speak and generate music then on the right are the more things that aren't quite there yet like one of them is to uh, the, the large language models uh, respond immediately. They don't contemplate. They, you know, they don't do what everyone in this room does. But there, but there apparently is considerable work going to let them have that. Figure out how to have them use that, develop that capability. Uh, uh, you know, we they are trained by people. They're not really generally being able to train themselves. They, you know, in other words, why can't they? You know, re, you know move. You know, have the AI do its own training of itself. That's in the works. Um, uh, they, they're already being customized. There are hundreds, thousands, I presume, apps now that for specialized training on top of a large language model. Like there's one called CoCounsel for that a lot of law, law firms are beginning to use right now, and it's and it's better than Michael Cohen did when you know when you give the fake. Uh, uh, legal citations, but uh, and and like one big law firm I read, you know, major law firm just uh, you know uh, uploaded uh, you know all of its pleadings, all of its papers, highly confidential, uh, and uh, but has figured out how to, to train that on top of an AI model, maintain the confidentiality, but much speeding up the writing of documents. Uh, and then the other thing is to really effectively communicate with other large language models. And that's, you know, that's where it gets a little scary because if they start talking and they're smarter than humans or it's nearly smart. Next slide. Uh, so, yeah, and I just wanted to, I, I, I showed this to our senior leadership group. I didn't, I, put, I think they enjoyed it. Didn't they make it? I don't know. So. <laughs> there was mixed reviews. <laughs> Yeah, Megan wanted, she thought we really should have, she told me this morning, we should have somebody come out in a costume, but I, I, I might've done that, but, but uh, Jessica told me I was limited to three slides on this issue. So, um, but there is a, a, there is a mem, the show goth that came out about a year now, it's probably, there's probably a new mem now, that it represents AI and the one on the right, you may see has a smiley face. Uh, uh, and uh, this is from, a, it's, what's this? it's from a, science fiction writer who I actually never read, but, you know, had the show goth. Uh, and uh, it's, some of this, some of the things came up from, uh, there was a, it, it, apparently at Elon Musk's 15, 2015 birthday party, thrown by his ex-wife. Uh, he had a very long discussion with Larry Page, the co-founder of Google and, 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 uh, um, Larry Page apparently uh, believes that the uh, once 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 the singularity is reached, once we have something we really think is at least as smart as a human, I don't know how you really fully determine that. Uh, um, uh, that these AIs might be very likable, and and his other view was if they're better than us, maybe they should take over. But Elon Musk, at the time at least, apparently according to the New York Times, expressed a uh, uh, opposition, and, and uh, um, he thought he thought they were dangerous to people. And Larry Page called him a species, so he was like, yeah, he was like into the human species as opposed to a broader look on things. And and uh, you know, it's unclear whether this already out of date. Say GPT three, and now we're now we got four, and we're moving on five. Um, so that's there is the background. It's worth reading the stuff and trying to stay on top of it a little bit. Next slide. And then for Bohm, uh, so, I mean, this is really important, perform analyses and write reports. Uh, and we do have this project, the, the SOX project, status of the outer continental shelf with an ecosystem-based management model associated with it. And, and with the staff working on it and I, uh, uh, want to do is to uh, you know uh, use SOX to uh, to assemble a well-vetted database or environmental studies and other things uh, and link it to the ecosystem based model 
that uh, uh, Jake Levinson and 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 Les uh, have been working on, uh, and uh, ideally uh, put that on top of a, a large language model and uh, and. The Interior Department does have uh, a, an Azure cloud contract with Microsoft that is has operational GPT-4, I understand. Although they're just in the kind of the early stages of trying to figure out how to use it apparently. And I'm just asking the staff to work with them. But, uh, to, and, but you can see, given what I just went through that Mr. Carpathy, Dr. Carpathy has presented that we, uh, I mean, we may be able to do a lot of the things we do uh, uh, and do it better, uh, you know, with what's coming. And I, everyone here that's worked on AI knows that those systems hallucinate. I mean, and I'm, you, I hope everyone here has tried some of them and maybe Googled yourself and found that it says you went to school somewhere you didn't or something. And, but, and there's no easy way out from that. We have to have, right now we need super quality control, but, but the future lies here heavily, I think. And if we do it right, it'll save us money. So even if we get situations like we have now where the Congress is not a very dependable funding partner for these kinds of things, um, uh, you know, we may be able to uh, do things less expensively and do them better if we work at it. And I think I'll just that's it. jump Next in there oh, as well for, on the AI front. So something that Boehm on a more local level, not looking futuristically at it. Um, over the last five to eight years, I'd say really focusing on technology advancements and looking at how we can structure our databases, identifying the appropriate metadata and other types of attributes to the studies. We mentioned the 1.25 billion with the big giant B that's been spent. That's just the environmental studies aspect. We also have all of the data that's been collected under geologic permits, um, under leases as well. So a lot of seismic data and other type of geophysical and geologic data that's been collected by industry and others since the 1940s. So I don't even know what that would total. We haven't spent the time to figure that out, but it's definitely worth more than 1.25 billion. And so viewing the data in the information that comes from that um, in the work products that everyone's been working on through the years as business assets and making sure that we are putting together the architecture, technologically speaking, that connects all of that in the background so we have everything available, we know what we have, we make it accessible, and then we can advance a lot of our analysis, the more mundane, tedious task to AI type of purposes that's really going to advance what we're doing and really free up the time of our scientists to do what we want with it and to provide those services for the public as well. It's because that's something that we've been advancing as well as just making it available to the public. That's a part of our mission as well. And so all of this works together, but just want to kind of ground it for a little bit, but that's something that we're actively working on right now. Yeah, and I think point uh, Megan made is really important that you know we don't have to solve all the world's problems immediately. Uh, uh, there's a lot of value in actually looking at using this for some simple things that take a lot of time. Uh, we're using it already for not a generative AI, but for FOIA, for example, to identify patterns and uh, in emails just to make the job of FOIA officers simpler. Already doing that. So I think that's it. Next slide. There you go. So thank you. Well, thank well, you. Bill, that was a mouthful. You know, that's a that's a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, we've got plenty of time for discussion on all, all the different points, and uh, I mean a very comprehensive review of uh, of of Bohm and. Uh, I wasn't actually anticipating the AI discussion at the end, but uh, I, I know those of my colleagues in academia where, where you know, AI is, is at the forefront with how you use it to teach. And it's really used on seven or eight different levels, not just writing, but also coding and, and how quickly that, that's going. And, and um, you know, it, it, it falls into the realm of scientific writing and, and authorship and, um, I know some professors, like my brother, for example, only gives only gives uh, exams with with this, because uh, you know to to so 
it's a it's a challenge that we're all struggling with in different avenues of how to use it and also how to uh, how to how to keep it from uh, taking away creativity. Uh, certainly, I don't know if you guys are fans of Nick Cave, but he uh, he wrote a great letter that Stephen Fry reads on YouTube, which hey, check it out if you're interested in it. But certainly on creativity and and and, and AI and in songwriting, so. Um, yeah, we'll throw it open to discussion. But oh. let's go ahead, Kevin. I, I just want to mention that we're also using other forms of AI beside large language models, various kinds of machine learning that have massively increased our creativity yeah. by using them as observational tools in big data, revealing processes we didn't even know were there. So, um this, this is a, we've, we've got a, a little bit of time and so the ability for for uh, the COSA members and 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 uh, the bone to to have some discussion on Bill's Bill's points and, and maybe points of clarification so well Dan you hands up yeah that was a great great introduction and while while you were talking there's a couple of things that came to mind is one being an academic who can retreat to the ivory tower I really appreciate the fact that you guys are in the front lines. And my point is, is that you had lots of aspirational endpoints, which what does the science tell us? And the problem is a lot of the science doesn't tell us, well, it certainly doesn't tell us what to do. And ideally <laughs> the science will tell us what the outcomes are if we take different paths. What I'm getting to is a lot of the science is, is really not, we're not to the point for many of the questions you have to answer. The science is not adequate. So I can retreat to my ivory tower because I don't have to make those decisions. You guys can't. And so it's really the interface in terms of how do we take the level of information we have to make the best decisions that we can, which is what you guys have to do. And so I, I bring that up as I appreciate the difficulty and the importance of that interface. But, and then the other thing I like to say is you talked about the history and, and obviously the history goes beyond the OEM, and I mentioned in the closed session, early in my career, I was part of the Outer Continental Shelf Environmental Assessment Program. UC Santa Cruz was part of, I can never remember if it was BLM or MMS and which came first. Mm -hmm. So many of our, and I also said earlier, there was no such thing as a baseline, an incredible amount of our first understanding of, coast of the, the Outer Continental Shelf Environment whether it was California, whether it was the East Coast, whether it was Alaska, came from ancestors of BOEM. Um, the, I think back at the California Current, the early work that we didn't have much knowledge of the distribution of marine mammals and funding set up the baseline from which we now all look back on in the night from the 1970s, a lot of the physical oceanography to understand these environments was funded by these programs. So it, it's just a, an acknowledge that I, I think it is pretty spectacular for the size of the organization that you are. You've probably had a disproportionate impact on the, on the basic understanding of these offshore environments. I, I'll throw the floor open. Any other questions or comments? That's the time for, for discussion. Please. This is just a really quick question. You know, I think you mentioned it, but it's interesting when you have the organization charts up there, you've got the Alaska one, but and the Gulf one, but you don't have the New England or the East. Where does that go? I remember you mentioned it, but it's, you know, I realized that we don't have a lot of, haven't had a lot going on in the past and that's probably why it doesn't exist. I think Megan's, Megan's interested in answering that letter. So there used to be an Atlantic region back in the MMS days. And then whenever Bohm and Bessie split off, um, that organization or reorganization didn't include one. So now we've been actively ever since then trying to establish it again, um, feel that we're um, definitely evaluating that and seeing what makes sense given the type of activity. It's very heavily on the offshore wind piece. It's very heavy on the marine mineral space. Um, so more than likely won't be seeing a lot of oil and gas, 
like we do see that as the dominant um, activity level in the Gulf of Mexico. And so how to structure things that were all coordinated together and even across the other regions as well that are doing similar types of, of work to support those activities. So that's something we are doing. Um, it is in the 25 budget, so that's public. So I can say that. <laughs> I, had, I had to think for a second on, on what's what's public and what's not. No, that was that, that one. I, <laughs> it, 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 the, the administration has proposed the creation of Atlantic region, and it would be effective October 1st if it goes forward. Or once Congress approves the budget. <laughs> which could be this time next year. But either way, we are moving forward with that. So any suggestions, um, things that people would like to see us concentrate a little bit more as that is forming, welcome the feedback. Probably know the answer to this, but um, 30 million, this comes up a lot not significant and we're going to have a deep dive on and expanding marine minerals into further parts of the outer continental shelf more distant territories things where there's not a lot of lack of a better word baseline information which you know and that type of oceanography is exponential cost increase so um has from a strategic point of view how has Bohm tried to think about that and then essentially work with Congress and others to, to put the framework into action, primarily increasing budgets? Because it's just, because this always tends to be a conversation of trade offs, right? And um, just trying to figure out you know, the complexity here and all of the great work. And yes, you can leverage so much, but I would imagine some of the conversation over the next day and a half is going to be particularly challenging because there's not a lot of entities, government agencies that are working in these more remote areas with maybe the exception of ocean exploration, uh, but that's mapping, right? So I'm just kind of thinking, you know, ahead and, and what has Bohm tried to influence or, or think about in terms of scaling the ESP to match the amount of work that's required by the agency? <laughs> and that might not be an easy answer, but just kind of some yeah. context. Uh, well, let me start. And then I'm I, Rodney I has some thoughts I, I gather. And I'm, I bet you Megan has something she wants to add on this too. We'll see. But I, I, now you, I think you do know the answer probably. And I, I'm not sure how to articulate it. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, that it is recognized with within BOEM that to do the job right for development in general, actually, and certainly including the uh, examination of what we might do for critical minerals warrants more money. And actually, 30 million is kind of, you know, that's an historical amount, but uh, uh, I'm not optimistic that we'll have that amount next year, for example, with the way things are. We don't know where, we don't know where Congress will go. Um, so we, uh, we want and need enhanced funding. And we do, we do make our case. Uh, uh, you know, I do, Rodney does. Uh, I, and Poem typically will for at least incremental increased funding. Uh, but, you know, we're constrained by overall budget requirements and you know and we we respond to what omb and the department of interior's budget office sort of required to balance and there's no no e no easy way just to and we we do shift our priorities we're, we're now spending most of our uh studies funding on offshore wind for example and that was not the case five years ago uh our uh, alaska funding is actually much reduced because of you know the uh, uh, shift in interest for oil and gas up there. Uh, so but it's still all within this pot of a limited amount. We have we have uh, 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 considered and advanced and I don't really know exactly how far things have gone, but the potential, for example, of a research percentage uh, associated with oil and gas revenue. So the Land and Water Conservation Act kind of thing uh, but uh, that really hasn't hasn't gone anywhere um, 
uh, Rodney, who will we'll note that we do, we really try hard to find ways to raise money with partners, especially federal partners for the big projects, but they're subject to similar constraints too. Uh, uh, and we are, uh, we are in the midst of developing for uh, uh, environmental monitoring uh, uh, of sound in particular, uh, but I hope it'll become broader than sound like eDNA and other, other things we mix in uh, 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 an option. It's not yet definitively approved, but an option that would, you know, on one hand say, if you don't exercise this option, company you need to do monitoring on your on your lease long term however long that exactly is uh, but another option is to actually provide a certain amount of money that you know based on the criteria that has been discussed with the companies to to BOEM to the studies program which which in turn though would would, would have a probably a nonprofit uh, uh, entity that can take funds from federal state local governments to to implement a monitoring system that 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 will be i mean it's just much more attractive when you think about it to do it that way because you can the companies fulfill their obligation by doing that but the system is being managed by those that, that are looking at the overall impacts of all these all of these projects so we're in the middle of that, and, and that'll help a little bit. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is there is sort of a private sector contribution side. We're still allowed to do that. It's every year it's in the appropriations bill. It could drop out. Uh, um, uh, but I don't know. It's troubling. And actually with, with, with a, you know, the, the partisan arrangement in Congress doesn't help with certainty of long term. Great. I'll, I'll chime in a little bit more and then pass it over to Rodney and Jeff, but to, to the question, since we're talking about the Marine Minerals Program over the next couple of days, I do think that the program as a whole has done a really good job on setting priorities um, in the critical mineral space for our national sand inventory, you know, two very separate documents that have been developed with the SMEs within the program and others across the different re BOEM regions or environmental, basically a whole of BOEM approach to say, these are our priorities. These are the objectives within each of those priorities that we're hoping to achieve over the next five to 10 years. And then from that, it becomes kind of a little bit of a brain trust and some brainstorming sessions within staff to develop proposals for research and other types of efforts, designing what it is that we would need as far as technology, all of those types of things that then can feed into budget initiatives and we put those forward every year. Um, Rodney's group's been, and Rodney himself has been instrumental in making sure that there's a certain part of the environmental studies budget that is carved out specifically for marine minerals purposes. In addition to the partnerships that we've been able to develop with NOAA, USGS and, and everywhere else um, so that we can leverage the expertise. Um, but we are constrained our budget, just like everyone else, yeah. um, but we're continually putting our hand out. We're starting to develop um, relationships and some strategies with external partners that can speak on our behalf when they're meeting with their congressional representatives to really advocate for BOEM as a whole and then the Marine Minerals Program. So we do have some limitations in that that we're trying to be creative to work around, but it's, um, it's definitely a process, but being able to look forward as much as we can and strategize as much as we can um, so we can incrementally make progress towards those goals has been really, really important. And that's where the, I mentioned before this conversation over the next couple of days and beyond is really critical to that point. But okay. I don't know, Rodney and Jeff, you wanna add? Yeah, uh, well, one thing I guess, well, I, I think you've all, uh, Bill and Megan mentioned basically everything I was going to say, but to, uh, to summarize, it's really, I think, three ways to really make this 30 million more. Um, uh, one is to enhance public-private partnerships. And yes, that's with, developer, with the wind developers, but with uh, uh, um, marine minerals companies, with, with other developers, with private sector companies, um, with the technology sector. So I think that's one really important thing. Um, so to uh, enhance public-private partnerships is one, to really embrace uh, innovation and emerging technologies. 
uh, and then to keep riding our budget initiatives like we do every year, building in uh, the innovation. Um, as far as the first one I mentioned, public-private partnerships, we've done a really good job over many years of, you know, working with universities and you know other federal agencies. Uh, that 30 million in any given year, we turn it into 60, and double it. Remember, we don't have ships, or satellites, or anything like that. If we're doing any type of animal telemetry from satellites, you know, we're using NASA, or we, you know, if we're going out doing kind of different types of surveys, we're using NOAA ships. You know, that's those things are not free. So that's you know kind of uh, you know you, you know work that we're actually taking our, our thirty million um, and enhancing that. If we can bring those same principles to the private sector, I think and, and work. Like Bill was saying, with the contribution authority for passive acoustic monitoring, it's one way, uh, but also just to cost share. Use our environmental studies program to cost share on work. Say we have, have a lease area or an ecosystem, say, you know, in the, in the Gulf of Maine or wherever, any place. If we want to spend $5 million of our studies program doing, uh, you know, e ecosystem baseline studies, and then we can work with developers or other interested parties up there to cost share that, along with universities, uh, along with the state. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, in enhancing partnerships, I think is really, really critical to building, you know, what we have and leveraging that 30 million. Um, right now, like I said, we can maybe double it. I want to triple it because I think we can. It's an all hands on deck approach. But the second thing is innovation too, and emerging technologies like we we're talking about for AI. A couple of years ago, I wanted to hire a, a chief innovation officer uh, in our program, which I'm still working on. Um, I also wanted to establish a new center for innovative ocean monitoring, which I'm still thinking about. Uh, but uh, things didn't exactly work out the way I wanted. But uh, we do have a, an FTE that we will be hiring a new chief innovation specialist or officer that's going to be coming into BOEM that will help all of our scientists uh, really uh, understand how best to employ you know, innovation and technology to whatever studies they're doing. So this, this person that, that's coming in, I really see that as, as a beginning step to really enhance and, and, and work with tech companies and other people and then bring that knowledge and information uh, back to our scientists when designing studies. So that's the second thing. And then I guess the third thing again is, is you know, continue to beat the drum on budget initiatives uh, because we do that every year and we, we we're gonna have to continue to, to do that. And, uh, you know, I've been here 25 years. I've got a couple funded. So, I mean, it's not zero. So maybe we'll get that, you know, that going as well. So, so, so I've got a, just a, um, a, a order for people to speak. I, I saw Lori's hand first. Or you still on? And then uh, uh, Jeremy, um, Jack, and then Les. Okay. So, so, so thank you for all of that overview. And, I have, it's just a really basic review, given the context of our conversations the next couple of days on marine minerals, where exactly are we defining the edge of the outer continental shelf and how does that bleed over into the deep sea and deep sea mining that is now such a hot issue, even in Congress? Maybe from a... It's uh, well. The United States is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, but we do regard the uh, the provisions related to outer continental shelves as customary international law that were uh, required in the State Department. Feel strongly about this to follow, and and uh, you know the 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 continental shelf of a nation in that provision in that article. Uh, extends at least to 200 nautical miles that everyone's got out now. But there are several tests, and you may know all this, but it, that uh, um, maybe not everybody does, but uh, uh, that uh, provide for uh, uh, nations to uh, assert uh, a continental shelf that goes out more than 200 nautical miles. And uh, you know, it relates basically to, the tools are designed to try to match the actual shelf place uh, there and it's limited to 350 miles uh, uh, and the united states so the united states it's what it's on that map i put up uh, i went through a, a, a really multi-year is a whole decade and uh, uh and one of the best lawyers at state who actually used to 
report to my wife when was went over to NOAA and was doing the work, and they just came out with their uh, extended continental shelf uh, 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 decisions, basically of the United States, and and the, so the the map. You remember the parts of the map? Yeah, uh, that and so that's well over. Uh, 200 nautical miles in, in a number of cases. Now that, you know, some, na some nations, I think, including China and Russia have already objected to that. Uh, the Arctic is a big flashpoint. Um, uh, and although of course the United States is not a party to the law of the sea convention and some on the more conservative side say, well, you know, that means we can just do it. We don't have to worry about going through the process that, you know, is, available for kind of uh, endorsement of uh, extended continental shelf and, and uh, um, but basically, and, and, but one of the issues on the other side is, you know, why would companies in, uh, be interested in investing in areas that are where the United States is not a party, it asserts this, but others disagree, are we creating vulnerabilities? And there was a 60 minutes thing that kind of related to that a little bit about a week ago. I don't know if many of you saw it. Um, so for at least 200 nautical miles, uh, it, uh, there's not any debate, except from the Chinese, like the nine dash map, if you're over that way. Right? I'll pass the baton over to Paul Knorr. He's our critical mineral specialist and would be helping to um, facilitate whenever we reach the point for deep sea mining. Okay, wasn't expecting that. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, so looking at the ECS areas in particular, which really aren't ECS anymore, they're OCS now. Um, just from a terminology perspective, that stopped in December when the executive order was issued or that FR was published. Um, it's now the OCS. There's only really, as I understand it currently, two areas where there's really critical mineral potential that would be relevant to BOEM. Uh, one is the Chukchi Peninsula. There's cobalt-rich crusts, other metals, um, scandium, things like that, uh, up in the Arctic. And then off the Blake Plateau, uh, there's, there's an extension that uh, pushes down into the abyssal plain. So there may be nodules down there, but we don't know. We need to look. Um, most of the other extended areas that were added, uh, I don't think will have much potential for critical minerals, deep sea mining, for example. Um, it's worth pointing out that the DISHMRA, the Deep Sea Hard Minerals Resources Act, uh, gives NOAA authority to issue leases in extra tech in international waters, basically. Uh, two of the hollow areas in the Clarion Clipperton zone that haven't been put under contract by ISA are actually legacy leases that uh, NOAA issued to Lockheed Martin back in the 1980s, and those still exist. Uh, anyway, I th probably. Jeff, yeah, you want to add? Uh, but Paul, thanks. I was going to mention Dishmara also, but um, <clears throat> my understanding is that a few of the members of uh, the ISA are actually questioning those leases at this point in time, since they're, you know, pretty valuable. Yeah, I'll also mention the International Seabed Authority as part of uh, the Law of the Sea it was established. So uh, the U.S. does participate as a delegation to that ISA, uh, along with uh, USGS and NOAA and BOEM. So we do follow the development of the um, exploitation regulations. They have exploration regulations in place, but not exploitation regulations. And my understanding is that they're supposed to finalize those in 25. Uh, they've been pushed off a few years. But yeah, we closely monitor that and participate as part of that delegation. Actually, I want to even add to that, that uh, uh, one of our BOEM reps, uh, who's been part of the delegation in, in Jamaica to the uh, this Seabed Authority, told me that BOEM was having a, a lot of influence because of, uh, just because the systems that we've used, you know, for leasing and so forth, uh, we were uh, sort of more familiar with how one might approach. So we, so we, even though we are observers, we're having, you know, some real effect. If I another just a point, I, I've got a message from uh, uh, 
some of the people online that uh, if you could introduce yourself when you when you speak because they're having a little hard time figuring out who, who's talking in the in the uh, in the room. And also, uh, uh, Juliet Lee posted the uh, announcement of U.S. extended continental shelf uh, uh, outer limits. So, so that mm. that link is up. Um, okay, uh, Jeremy stepped out. Jack, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, Jack. <clears throat> excuse me, Jack Barth, Oregon State University. I just want to follow up with that partnership comment. I think you touched on it, Rodney. There's there's uh, the federal partners. You know, we're all pretty big fans of NOP. Um, how about an analog of the cooperative institutes that uh, NOAA does with academic institutions? Does BOEM have an entity like that or has looked at that? Well, well yeah, we, we do uh, obviously a lot of cooperative agreements with the universities. Um, we do have uh, uh, certain agreements with uh, LSU and University of Alaska, uh, Fairbanks, um, the, through the Coastal Marine Institute, where we have a cost share with them. So we actually do cost share in, in that way. And we go through the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Units, which is ran by the Park Service. And, and to, if we go through that entity and uh, work with the member institutions, we get a lower overhead. So more of our money can be spent by science, uh, you know, for, towards science and less admin cost. So we have these certain avenues that uh, we're going down. We're not, you know, of course, you know, uh, exactly like NOAA has with their institutions and everything, but we, we do have that authority. Is there, is there something else you're thinking about that I might? I was just what? seeing that as a, a, to leverage 30 million, just like you were talking about. So mm -hmm. making that easier to, to uh, putting in place the procedures to make that go quickly to leverage the academic sector. Right. I mean, a lot of our work is done with the academic sector, but like I said, it's, you know, through our existing cooperative agreements authority, or the, like I said, the CESU, the CMI, uh, we, we go through, um, sometimes with USGS, they have their science centers, for example, so and they're affiliated with uh, academic institutions, which we also utilize those as well. Um, um, but any other additional ideas, I am willing to, to uh, open up and try to explore, certainly. So thank you. Yeah, and Jack, I, 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 so taking what Rodney just said, the, uh, uh, I mean, if what you're thinking over like the wildlife co-ops that Fish and Wildlife had for a long time, or I guess NOAA that I'm less familiar with, there were just, it was a lot more money. So it's, you know, so there's an opportunity to have like a big portfolio of continuing offices uh, and but with the amount of money we have what Rodney described is pretty much all we think we can do yeah I was just reflecting on the, the the mission has gotten so much bigger right you know a person like me could have ignored it 30 years ago and said it's just oil and gas but it's everywhere now it's in the water column it's 350 nautical miles offshore I mean it's just a larger group of people that are interested and want to help, I'm sure. Thanks. Um, on the same topic of the 30 million, I, I'm not sure that people appreciate the scope of the opportunity here. Um, the, the development of the partnership model parallels what's happened with NASA. But when people think of NASA, they think of the whole universe. What we're really talking about in broad strokes is not really just Bohm's jurisdiction, but two thirds of the surface of the planet about which we know almost nothing. And it's possible that our need for the resources that we know are there could expand our vision of what we're doing and, and view this as a huge opportunity for exploration, for basic exploration and see and try to urge Congress to fund it with that in mind. That's really the scale of the problem and the level of excitement that should surround it. I have, I have a bit of an anecdote on that one too, because a, a friend of mine, a scientist, you guys, probably some of you know Bob, Bob McNaught up in, uh, up in Alaska. Uh, we were talking, he was doing a before after control impact uh, uh, study up there. And I said, well, how's it going? He said, it's really hard to do a before impact, before after control impact study when every time you make a toe, you discover a new species. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
have I, I had one question sure. to follow up, not on the, the budget per se, but uh, with the expanding territories piece of this, how is how is BOEM organized to deal with that? Is it the minerals program as a national program? Because I know you have the regional pieces of it. And I'm just thinking in terms of, has there been anything in uh, discuss government to government, particularly with state department and defense given some of the sensitivities and also other sources of funding around these areas that that Bo may not have capacity for, because this seems like a little bit of a unique structure compared to offshore wind, um, oil and gas, in terms of you know who's out there and who's collected information, and and then there's a lot of other initiatives that bring in money to a lot of these territories, and where is the territory to BOEM relationship when we're starting to talk about management of resources. And so those online, Megan Carr, um, the jurisdiction that was expanded into the territories does include critical mineral um, and, and also sand and gravel. Um, and so we've been working heavily with USGS to look at their perspective maps and have, a, and you'll see that in some of the slides later on today and tomorrow, but where we think there are things, you know, where in theory there could be with the geologic processes and the ocean process that we know exist um, in going out and coordinating with NOAA. So wherever NOAA is, we try and get extra ship time to get some baseline environmental data, baseline resource assessment data, but we are limited by their plans and we just kind of are latching on to them but yeah i think as that program grows meaning you know we're getting more and more information we can then be a little bit more focused and, and um, have a louder voice and i think as the conversation around critical mineral supply chain deepens a little bit more particularly as you know we are in the beginning of the supply chain by getting the raw resources in the domestic waters or you know terrestrially as well but I, I think that's going to get a little bit um, more accelerated in that. But right now we are, you know, just with the limitation, um, kind of the first thing that we're looking at is going out with the request for information. Now the timing of that, we're not quite sure, but that would be more than likely for all of the territories um, to try and understand what is out there. And that's where we would have that more heavy coordination with the other departments across the government, as well as with industry and, and anyone else just to see what it is, because um, the vast majority of the data that is out there and the research that is out there is not in English. So that's a limitation. And so how are we going to have access to that and really make sure that the translation is correct and then use it in our applied ways. So that's, that's a challenge that we have to oversee as well. And so where is State Department in some of this? Because I know one, they have big ocean budgets that they're typically slow to use. And to the point you just made in terms of uh, the territories, language, things like that, seems that they could be a huge enabler here. I don't think we have a good answer to that question. So we're, we're developing that relationship to get an answer. Yeah, and I think it's also, I think, safe to say, uh, I, this is an issue that uh, there's a lot of attention and. It is, you know, things will happen going forward. I, there, I mean, my, from my own sense, there, there are different voices in the State Department, just as there are elsewhere. And, you know, it, it kind of evolves around, uh, you know, the balance between development and their research concern over biology. And it's a little bit a, a distinct a difference between OES at State and the energy side of State Department. Um, I think we actually would be would benefit a lot from by will from more conversations, you know, within the government. Hey, hey Bill, I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll just add that we're part of a, a couple of uh, uh, intergovernmental committees uh, with regard to critical minerals. We're part of the NSTC Critical Minerals Subcommittee, which practically um, almost all the departments uh, participate in, and we're also part of an inter 
agency policy committee specific on seabed mineral resources. So there are those conversations that have been been ongoing, but but frankly, they're in early discussions, and we haven't gotten to the point where you know we're totally in sync with everybody in terms of you know organization money et cetera et cetera but those conversations are being held i just remind everyone again to please in, introduce themselves i just got another jeff right now we're sorry that's all right yeah, yeah I, this I, is I was bill brown <laughs> no worries so paul nor uh just the point uh, with the territories it, state department doesn't really have any involvement in that they're part of the united states it's the department of interior's office of insular affairs that coordinates relations with the territories and under the inflation reduction act when they were added to the ocs uh, they're given the same status as states so it's basically the conversation with a territory for us is the same as having a conversation with a state government it's worth adding to that as uh, noting what paul said uh, we we do have pretty regular discussions with the Insular Affairs Office. Uh, actually, our uh, our environmental experts help them uh, uh, develop categorical exclusions for a number of projects, which weren't limited to the U.S. territories. They were for the ones that we have uh, uh, relation uh, you know, for the freely associated state relationships like Palau and uh, Marshall Islands. Um, uh, so. They're very, they're small. They, they, Insular Affairs has, last time I checked, 30 staff. Uh, uh, you know, they put out a lot of money. I think it's in the neighborhood of 300 million. Don't hold me to that a year, but it's largely through these big uh, conduits, more general support. So uh, we are having those discussions, but it's, it's, you know, it's not clear exactly how that. We could will translate into something for what we're talking about the, the state department it, i mean what paul says totally right it's there the, this is part of the united states but there is this whole issue of critical minerals and how important they are to the nation that that which the state department is very involved in and so i i, I do think and it's it's what jeff said that i you know we're, we have we have all these structures and rodney's involved in them too he's there's so many committees he's honest you can't really remember uh, but uh, this particular issue is is going somewhere. <laughs> yes, I would say so. <laughs> Jeremy, you had a, a question. Yes, and I'm sorry I had to jump out there. Uh, and hopefully I didn't miss too much. Uh, but sort of following on this point of uh, greater cooperation of, with Department of State, it's been my observation that that there could be much closer cooperation between the Bohm Environmental Studies Program, the Department of Energy, uh, Wind Energy Technology Office, uh, NOAA Sea Grant, uh, but particularly DOE WETO, because they've got lots of money um, and can help not just on the wind side, but and then if we go outside of Weto into other parts of, of Department of Energy, they've got lots of money uh, that could be very helpful in, uh, in uh, investigations related to critical minerals uh, as well, because that goes into the, to the EVs, it goes into the wind turbines, uh, it goes into all of those things and it goes all into the energy transition. So I would re should really think that that's certainly one way to leverage uh, additional funds. Uh, I would also note, and it's not something that we like as university researchers, and there, there was one recent exception from, from DOE, uh, but both NOAA and DOE uh, have some, sort, some cost sharing involved. Uh, and, and that's certainly a model that uh, BOEM uh, could, could look at uh, as a way to uh, expand its rather limited funds, so. Dan? <clears throat> Dan Costa. Yeah, Dan Costa, UC Santa Cruz. Jack made a comment about institutes and I just looked up, I don't, I, I imagine the BOM people know about it because I all of the institutes I looked at, BOEM is part of it. And this is the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. And it's a, 
uh, it's a pretty excellent way to move federal dollars to researchers, especially in academics, but it's not limited to academics, but it's also a pretty substantial network uh, that I was helped in, helped create the, the Californian one. Then the, the other comment I wanted to make, we're talking about your $30 million budget and I, going back to my ancient history, the OXEP program, which funded just Alaska in 19, late 70s, early 1980s money was $22 million in 1980s dollars. And you're looking at 30 million in today's dollars. I, I can, Dan, thank you. We, we have noted that. <laughs> uh, and we are, we are an active member of the CESU. We're you know, really interested in using it wherever we can. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I don't see any other questions. Well, I do have one myself, but it's more of just a, a question of clarity. Uh, Bill, in your presentation, you said, um, or there was a comment, I think, I think it was you, uh, fitness to operate. And I, I didn't under, or, or was that, sorry, Megan, that was you. I, I don't understand, or I guess I'm not familiar with fitness to operate. You mean the company's fit to operate or? Yes. And so, so Megan Carr for those online, um, part of the, one of the first things that President Biden had the department do is a comprehensive review of the oil and gas program that was in conjunction with BLM and, and Bessie, our sister agency. And um, one of the things that came from that report was recommending that we move forward with the fitness to operate standard. And so that's something that um, Boehm and Bessie have been working on together since then and more aggressively over the last six months on what are the types of things that we need to look at for, you know, are they good on their financial obligations? Are they, you know, particularly whenever we have our financial assurance rulemaking finalized later this year, um, there's going to be a considerable um, amount of bonding that's going to be now requested of these companies. And so are they good on that obligation? Have they been having any environmental violations? Have there been any other types of criteria that we're coming up with? What are the thresholds for that? You know, so that's all being worked out. Um, so whenever we have a proposed rulemaking, everyone will have comments to share, I'm sure, on, on what those criteria should be, the thresholds, are they being proposed appropriately? But really, um, how are we going to also share the information and the data between the agencies so that we can work together a lot better and be more coordinated for making decisions. And so it's not just bone making decisions in isolation. It's not just Bessie making decisions in isolation, um, that there's good coordination with industry as well and making sure that we're not um, gonna be creating an environment that's unintentable for them to continue operating as well. And so that's um, in the works. That's um, about the highest level summary that I can provide, I think. Does that make sense? It, it does. It, uh, great. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And also, I mean, the, the, where we've been on the East Coast working with the wind farms where we've had these companies pulling out of their agreements and stuff, does that tie into that kind of, uh, that, that kind of thing? I don't think companies choosing to not, or I guess if they choose not to move forward with the project, that would not go into a fitness to operate. But let's say um, there are certain things that they do outside of a plan or whether that's for exploration or development that's been approved, you know, that would result in a, um, in an ink or notice of non-compliance. And so how many of those a company acquires, you know, things, things along those lines or the severity of that non-compliance could play in. Thank you. Any, uh, it's almost uh, break time. Any other uh, comments or we could break a couple of minutes early. Any, it's, well, I'll just say it's going to be a fascinating meeting. And I think we're, we're going to, after the break, we're going to dive into it uh, a little more. But uh, gosh, you couldn't get more uh, uh, exciting than the kind of, uh, you know, marine dynamics we're talking about and, and, and uh, the impact. So thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good, good break. And we'll, uh, we'll start right back up at uh, uh, 11 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. For those online, we'll be back at 11. Okay. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Hope everyone had a few minutes to gather their thoughts after the first presentation. We're going to jump in now with uh, 
introduction to to Bohm's uh, marine uh, mineral program, and and although he's he's not on the agenda, Jeff is going to lead off with a with a kind of a ten minute overview. So everyone's set. All right, Jeff, please. Hey, thanks, Kevin, and uh, thanks for uh, listening to me for at least a you know a few minutes. Uh, we just wanted to give a broad overview of the uh, of the program. Uh, we we have a a story map that we're gonna navigate through for this part of the presentation. Uh, so fingers crossed it works. Uh, so anyway, let, let me get started. Um, Ariel, can you uh, advance the uh, story map? Yeah, stop right there. Okay, uh, just wanted to briefly talk about our mission. Uh, marine Minerals Program is the environmental steward of marine minerals on the OCS. And um, we review requests for exploration of minerals uh, on the Outer Continental Shelf. Uh, and we also review and issue leases for marine minerals on the Outer Continental Shelf. And so throughout today and tomorrow, we're gonna be describing and providing examples of the ways we utilize and rely on science uh, to inform our decision-making uh, to fulfill this mission taking into account the variety of marine mineral types that there, there are on the outer continental shelf, and then the different environments that the marine, min, marine minerals occur on, on the outer, outer continental shelf. So we're a, a really small program within a relatively small bureau. We have about uh, 21 staff right now. So uh, take a look at the, or, or remind yourself about the uh, 3.2 billion acres of OCS. Uh, so, we have a lot of uh, territory that we, that we, that we cover. Um, so our success in accomplishing our mission depends upon maintaining and building upon the strong relationships and partnerships that we've developed over the years with the public, private, and academic sectors that we've worked with. Next, uh, thanks. So let's start at the beginning. What is a marine mineral? A uh, few several types that we, we're gonna be talking about. Uh, traditional sand and gravel for coastal restoration projects. And the bulk of today, we're gonna to be talking and focusing our uh, discussion on sand and sediment for coastal restoration and beach nourishment. I know everybody's really kind of jazzed up about critical minerals and there was a lot of talk about that. We're gonna be talking about that tomorrow. So, so maybe pivot and start thinking more about uh, uh, sand and sediment resources. Uh, then we also are going to be talking about critical minerals uh, as part of that marine mineral suite. And then there's another, another form of marine mineral that we've dealt with in the past, aggregates and uh, commodity minerals outside of critical minerals. For example, back in the late 1990s, um, a company in New Jersey requested a potential uh, lease sale for aggregate material offshore. Uh, so there's that that we're gonna be dealing with. And then also, for example, gold up in Alaska, there's been interest, potential interest in uh, gold development as a commodity mineral. So that's another uh, category of marine mineral that we deal with. Next, Ariel. So this slide probably looks familiar. It uh, covers the uh, outer continental shelf, includes the extended continental shelf, and includes the uh, uh, territories. Um, so as, as Bill mentioned, 3.2 billion acres. So that's a quarter, essentially extending, uh, increasing our uh, responsibility uh, by a quarter of, uh, of acreage. So the program uh, has a lot of things that we do with, uh, with 21 people. We do resource evaluation and environmental research uh, G&G exploration. We do environmental assessments for proposed uh, exploration activities and leasing activities. We, uh, we handle a lot of data uh, with regards to our national offshore sand inventory, and that'll be increasing as we deal with critical minerals. So we have a what's called the Marine Minerals Information System that we've developed over the years, and we've mentioned at uh, previous COSA meetings uh, that's um, uh, central repository of all our all of our data, and then a, a huge part of our of our work is uh, stakeholder engagement with regard to 
our negotiated agreements and um, as part of our environmental studies process. Next. So we do have um, uh, regulations in place guiding all, all parts of our, our program. On the left uh, shows the uh, legal framework that we work under and our authority comes from the Outer Continental Shelves Lands Act. And then we have um, regulations in place for prospecting for marine minerals, uh, both commercial and non-commercial. And then we have regulations in place dealing with uh, leasing of minerals and operations. These are competitive uh, processes, the uh, 581s. It's a competitive process, very like oil and gas, where companies would bid on uh, developing uh, minerals. And then we have uh, uh, regulations in place for negotiated non-competitive agreements. So these are agreements that we have in, uh, that we um, uh, work with uh, project proponents and stakeholders to uh, provide sand and sediment for beach nourishment and coastal restoration. So the bulk of our uh, activity up to this point and the uh, leasing that we've done is uh, under the 583s of negotiated processes. I think we've issued nearly 70 agreements uh, over the last uh, few decades. Um, but with the um, critical minerals and other commodity minerals, we'll certainly uh, be exercising the uh, 581s. I just wanna point out um, that with, uh, with, with our current regulatory structure, <clears throat> There's almost a disincentive for industries to uh, uh, request uh, uh, leases uh, with, well, let me back up. Uh, there is a disincentive for companies to request a prospecting permit for, from us to do, for example, critical mineral prospecting, because that does, doesn't, having a prospecting permit doesn't give them exclusive rights to a lease. So that's a little di disincentive why a company would wanna pour millions of dollars into uh, prospecting uh, and then not have exclusive rights to develop those minerals. Next. Thanks, Ariel. Okay, so we've talked a bit about uh, budget uh, this morning and the Marine Minerals Program uh, has uh, enjoyed an increased budget over the last several years uh, in FY this fiscal year. Uh, we, we have realized a 4% reduction in our budget. So we currently have uh, or appropriated $13.8 million. That's a decrease of nearly $600,000 from, uh, from last year. And when you take into account that reduction plus inflation, uh, certainly uh, $13.5 million doesn't go a long way. Um, and in terms of how we spend our money, about a third of it goes to personnel uh, about less than 50% goes to uh, resource evaluation work for, for sand and sediment, built, basically building our national offshore sand inventory. And then 15% uh, goes to critical mineral work. So do the math. I mean, we're essentially spending $2 million to do critical mineral work over 3.2 billion acres. Uh, and we only have two uh, dedicated staff working on critical minerals. So we're, we're extremely resource limited in terms of what we can do. Uh, so we do have to be creative on how we're uh, utilizing that funding, funding, working with USGS and NOAA to, to um, collect information to inform uh, the offshore critical mineral component of our program. Next. So how are we organized as a program? Uh, we have uh, FTE ceiling of 25. Uh, currently, we have 21 staff on board. Uh, the division within the Office of Strategic Resources has uh, uh, FTE ceiling of 16. We currently have 15 staff. Uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, interviewing for uh, the 16th person. We have one uh, branch in the division, Marine Minerals Resource Management Branch, and that's led by uh, Jeff Weichel. Uh, and then uh, the, the uh, marine mineral component in the Gulf of Mexico has a FTE ceiling of nine and they currently have six uh, on staff. Uh, and we're composed, comprised of uh, oceanographers, geologists, uh, program analysts, and uh, biologists. Um, 
So once again, small program uh, within a relatively small bureau, but this is relative, this is how we're organized at the moment. But like we've talked about this morning, there's a proposed Atlantic region that would uh, certainly have a marine mineral component to it. And, and we would have to reassign and reallocate uh, resources to that, that region. Uh, next. So since we are a relatively small program with a relatively small number of people, we certainly, uh, similar to the budget, we, we reach out uh, to, to other groups within uh, the, uh, the Bureau to um, tap into their expertise. And we, we work closely with the resource evaluation groups, both in headquarters and the regions. We work within uh, the Office of Strategic Resources with our leasing and policy uh, division. And uh, particularly recently, we've been developing st uh, standard operating procedures for critical mineral uh, leasing with them. Uh, we work uh, really closely with Rodney because he has a lot of money. So we try to get more money from him, <laughs> right, Rodney? Uh, and, uh, and then we, we do work with a renewable energy program, mostly in terms of uh, multi-use conflicts, for example, export cables, uh, that would make landfall. We want to make sure that they're not cutting through important uh, sand resources and then basically taking out uh, a large portion of uh, resources that could be used for beach nourishment. Next. So we're going to show a little video here uh, and then I'll hand it over to Jessica, right, Jessica. Uh, before we start, I just want to make the caveat that uh, we tried to get Brad Pitt and Ryan Gosling, uh, but they deferred. Uh, and uh, so I'll just say that the individuals in this video uh, aren't going to quit their day jobs and become actors. So I'll just leave it at that. So you can start the video. Thanks. <laughs> Risks from stronger and more frequent storms are increasing and sea levels are rising along our nation's coast, threatening coastal communities and the economies they serve. One major storm can cost billions, displace entire coastal populations, and severely damage or destroy habitat. Against this backdrop, critical infrastructure and valued ecosystems face chronic coastal erosion. After a major storm, residents, visitors, and businesses are eager to see a speedy response, including restoration of beaches to pre-storm conditions. We also know that our nation's coasts will continue to face the risks of rising sea levels, severe erosion, and habitat change for many years to come. What will our coasts look like in 10, 20, or 50 years? What can we do now to build more resilient coastal communities for the future? First, there are multiple federal agencies working together to deal with this issue, and the Marine Minerals Program within the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, is an essential part of that team. BOEM is unique. It's the only federal agency with the authority to lease offshore sand from federal waters for coastal restoration projects. Strong partnerships are key to the success of the Marine Minerals Program. BOEM partners with communities and other state and federal agencies to identify and lease sand in federal waters for restoration projects. To reduce risks from future storms and maintain beach and dune features to support wildlife, recreation, tourism, and national security. Second, to properly manage these valued and finite resources on a national scale, we must know where the sand is, how much exists, and if it's a good match for the beaches or wetlands where it would be placed. We need to know who else is interested in that same area of the ocean, such as oil and gas pipeline companies, commercial fishermen, and subsea cable companies, so the resource remains available to meet future demand. To help answer these questions, we in the Marine Minerals Program are working with stakeholders to develop a national offshore sand inventory. Building an inventory involves identifying the location of existing sand resources relative to the need, figuring out where we need more data, 
and working together to fill the data gaps. Despite 30 years of research, we are barely keeping up with the growing number and size of projects. Part of the solution is the geodatabase we have developed. It maps, organizes, and manages all this sand resource and environmental data for coastal managers, engineers, and other stakeholders to use in planning. We call it the Marine Minerals Information System. This allows us to take stock of what is available and where the resource is getting low. Third, BOEM's stewardship mission also includes managing environmental impacts. At BOEM, we invest in world-class research to help us make informed decisions. Our environmental research tells us how animals and their habitats may be affected by construction activities. Our sea turtle tracking studies tell us what their behavior patterns are and when and where they are located within a project area. In another study, we are working to explore how fish use sand shoals. We study the best ways to explore and dredge sand resources in order to maximize long-term availability while minimizing or avoiding risk to animals and habitat. BOEM's Marine Minerals Program plays a key role in reducing coastal risks by researching, identifying, and managing offshore sand for the nation, promoting coastal restoration, and helping coastal communities be prepared and resilient for decades to come. I think that was going to be the most embarrassing part of the whole day for me. Uh, it looked pretty good though, right? It was good. Um, so um, my name is Jessica Malandine. I am in the Marine Minerals Program based in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, before I go too far into this, I do want to acknowledge that the, um, the person in the sky that we keep speaking to is Ariel Kay, who also is a data analyst for the Marine Minerals Program and has graciously agreed to, to run um, the storyboard. And, and she was a major part of developing it. So it's not the name of the storyboard and it's not the AI uh, that we secretly have hidden um, hidden away. Um, so thank you, Ariel, for running this. Um, so to kind of transition from the video that we were just showing, I wanted to kind of explain what the flow of this presentation was gonna be, kind of what the goal is. Um, obviously, coastal resilience is, is the primary focus here, particularly in regards to the sand and gravel component of our program. Um, which is the part of the program that this 101 is going to cover. Critical Minerals, the 101 led by Paul um, and others tomorrow will be tomorrow. Um, so as part of that, we're going to talk about some of our key areas, the resource evaluation components, environmental stewardship, and how all of that plays into making informed decisions, particularly with things such as multi-use, um, kind of um, navigating multi-use across uh, multiple programs and industries. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and move forward. So to kind of give a little bit of an engagement component, we've incorporated a couple trivia questions so that we win at the games later tonight. Um, so you can kind of say the answer out, of, out loud if you want, or you want to take a guess. I'll let you pause, consider it. This is a multi-choice answer. Anyone? Any of these not specific? All right, Ariel, go ahead and show. If you guess that all four of them are part of this program, you would be correct. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about these in a moment. Um, go ahead, next one. All right, so next question. What other federal agency do we often work with when talking about sand and gravel? And my minerals folks, please keep your thoughts to yourself. <laughs> oh, it could be all of them, yep. Yeah. All right, Ariel, what do we have? So the US Army Corps of Engineers is a federal entity constructs probably the bulk of, of our projects. Um, we do work with the other two in some capacity, but um, the other two are not out there currently building um, beaches and restoration projects. Uh, go ahead and we'll transition into the presentation. So you will get questions at the beginning of every category. So just prepare yourself for that format as we go through. Um, so, um, Jeff and the 101 before that kind of showed our broader BOEM uh, 
area, jurisdictional areas. Um, but I wanted to kind of frame this conversation a little bit differently because we are limited by what we can do when it comes to sand and gravel. So the map that you're looking at right now is actually um, our range um, of accessible resources for sand and gravel. Um, and that's largely due to dredging limitations. We are the dredge fleet that we have in the US is restricted um, a good deal, usually less than 150 feet. I think last I checked the current dredge depth, the max dredge depth is, is 130. So we are pretty limited, even though we have a larger jur jurisdictional scope, we are limited to some extent on uh, based on technology. Um, and like we had talked about with coastal resilience and stewardship in mind, um, we're looking at infrastructure protection, ecosystem restoration, habitat creation, and resource sustainability as kind of the drivers for a lot of the leasing projects that we support. Um, I will note that most of our borrow areas that we lease, so our leased areas that we provide access to are about three to nine nautical miles off the coast, a little bit closer in the Atlantic, a little bit further in the Gulf of Mexico, just based on the way that the topography is. We can go ahead and move forward. To give you a little bit of sense of where we're at right now, as far as active projects, you'll notice this map only covers the Atlantic and the Gulf. Um, so we do not have any active pro projects in the West currently. Um, but as far as projects that we do have ongoing, there are about seven that are active right now, seven that are in the works and about to come on board any day, um, as well as a, a number that are completed or expired. Um, and expired essentially means that a lease was granted, but for one reason or another um, did not move to construction. So um, our leases are um, limited in time. So usually it's a couple years, maybe up to five, depending on the scale of the project. It's a one-time use only agreement. Um, and after the expiration or the construction of the project, that lease then um, is completed. Go ahead and move on, Ariel. So this is a very busy slide. I'm gonna hang here a second, so don't stress if you're trying to read all of it at once. Um, so the, the big piece here that I wanna know is that BOEM is in all of these resiliency projects. We are a partnering agency. We do not construct these projects ourselves and we are rarely, never <laughs> the lead. Um, so we rely on a lot of partner agencies and localities to kind of guide us through the project process. And so what you're looking at on the right is kind of a typical project workflow where you move from identifying that there's a problem, a beach is, is gone or eroding, um, and then moving through identification of potential resources, environmental evaluations and considerations, which is where ESP in particular for the program really plugs into the leasing process for us. Um, and then you kind of move through other steps that we have less involvement with, but are, are still kind of engaged in as a team member, the engineering and design, um, any real estate acquisition, that would be more of a core of engineers um, component if they're involved. The most interesting part for me is that even though there's a lot of steps that lead up to a lease that we execute, um, and that would be typically where you would consider us to be plugged in legitimately right into a, a project there's a whole lot of steps that happen before that that Boehm's really involved with but it's not until the very end of the kind of project life cycle that Boehm actually issues a lease provides access to those sediment resources and then the construct the construction starts we do have some stipulations and requirements that we incorporate into our leasing agreements a lot of them environmentally driven some are data driven um, but ultimately we kind of work hand in hand with the, the lead agency um, to construct it. Um, Jeff did mention that the leasing authority comes from OSLA, specifically section 8K. And I just wanna note, there's a couple specific requirements here. One is the purpose with which the project is being built. So shore protection, beach or wetland restoration um, is, is the, the guiding <laughs> principle there, right? So if you're not doing that, then you don't really qualify for a non-competitive negotiated agreement or a lease from us. Um, but there's a couple others too, it needs to be undertaken by a federal state or local entity or funded in whole or in part by um, a federal entity. Um, so those are kind of the guidelines that essentially determine whether or not you can or cannot receive a lease from us. Um, and as, as you noted in the trivia, uh, our negotiated agreements can be with federal partners like the Corps of Engineers, but we also work with counties, townships, um, and states as well. 
Let's go ahead and transition. Um, you did hear uh, the Marine Minerals Information System mentioned on the video. That is our kind of information and data system. And, and um, Victoria <laughs> is going to talk a little bit more in depth about that here in a little bit. But one of the perks of having data uh, in one location is that it can be synthesized by not a person, <laughs> just <laughs> like itself. Um, so this is our actually our public dashboard that shows all of our marine minerals information. All of you in this room can access it at any point to see where we are with construction, how much we've built, where we've built, who we've had leases with, what the trends are. Um, this is a really great platform to kind of keep track of what's going on. It's my understanding, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, that this is used for a good bit by congressional entities and others to, to look, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so great resource, uh, public resource that's available. Let's go ahead and transition. So we are seeing an increasing demand for OCS materials, and there's probably a handful of reasons, probably some that are, aren't even on this slide, but we do have increased storm activity across the board. Um, with increased activity means resources diminishing in other areas. The states in particular are running out of um, viable sediment resources. It also adds to a, the sediment budget by taking sand from outside of a system and moving it in. Um, that certainly helps build that reserve of material. Um, wave climates and other environmental or physical oceanography um, components are less impacted the further away you move from land-based areas. Um, and then certainly the improvement to sustainability, particularly with geologic and geomorphic function. Um, and this, the video that you're seeing is a project that was constructed in um, the Gulf of Mexico not that long ago. And go ahead and transition again. Um, so there are a lot of different types of dredge equipment that exist out in the world, but in talking about specifically OCS-based um, types, there's really only two that are used with any frequency. The first and the more common one is a hopper dredge, um, which is self-propelled. And as you see in the video, it kind of acts like a vacuum. So the it'll sit on the bottom and then it'll move usually in a linear direction before it makes a turn um, across a borrow area. The um, transport distance for these are typically three to 30 miles and the material typically goes into the hull or the hopper of the ship, hence its name. Um, and then it steams to a uh, discharge or um, pump out location where it then gets transferred to the beach. Um, this is our more common one just because it's a ocean going certified vessel <laughs> usually. So we switch to the next one. The other one that's less common, we use it, we seem to use it a little bit more in the Gulf than the Atlantic does, but the other type is a cutter head. It is not self-propelled. It uh, uses a tug system and a cabling system that essentially windshield wipers the intake across the seafloor. This one's a little bit different in that the intake point actually gets buried into the sediments and then starts the slurry to vacuum it up. Um, and this one does not have a hopper or hull component to it. It's typically a pipeline system. So it'll create that slurry and then get pumped to, sh pumped to shore. We have had some instances where it's been pumped into a scow and then tugboats transport scows, but that's not, um, not that common. And these typically aren't ocean going vessels. So the conditions have to be pretty superb um, to use these offshore. Um, and deciding which type of vessel is used is entirely dependent on the contractor that's hired by the lead agency that's constructing the project um, and what their needs and bandwidth are. So go ahead and transition. So just to give you a couple examples, um, this, so this is Wallops Island in Virginia. Um, just as a point of reference, as aerial slides kind of back and forth, there's a water tower that's about halfway up. So if you go back the other way, Ariel, Yep, you can kind of see the towers about halfway up um, as kind of like a, a point of reference for the increase in shoreline. That one was used to protect the NASA facility there. It was the infrastructure protection component um, of this project. Um, and if you'll go to the next one, Ariel. The other example is in the Gulf, which is Caminata Headlands. Um, it was one of our biggest projects and the first one in the Gulf 
uh, of that scale. Um, and this one was really focused a little bit more on um, habitats and um, that wetland area behind it. I will note though that Port Fouchon is hidden in this image. It is hiding back behind it is the largest port <laughs> in the area, um, but there's a, a big swath of wetland uh, between the barrier island and Port Fouchon. So it was critical not only from an environmental um, resiliency perspective, but also for the protection or continued protection of the port and its channels. We'll go ahead and transition here. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Victoria, to talk you through some resource evaluation and environmental components. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, like Jessica said, my name is Victoria Brady, and I am a biologist with the Marine Minerals Program at headquarters. Um, and so we're going to start off here again with a trivia question. Uh, this one is, which state has used the largest volume of sand from the OCS, the Outer Continental Shelf. Any guesses? It's narrowed down Gulf of Mexico Atlantic. Florida, great guess. Louisiana, I think I heard that. Ariel, go ahead. The answer is Louisiana. And then um, an interesting follow-up question. Which state has the most leases, and this is specific to the Marine Minerals Program. I think I heard someone say it earlier. Florida, <laughs> yes. And so the point we wanted to make here was just, uh, it's kind of interesting just because a state has the most leases doesn't necessarily mean it's used the most sand. All right, we'll go ahead and move forward. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk to us about um, resource evaluation. So the National Offshore Sand Inventory, you've heard that mentioned today, that is the first resource consulted for our offshore sediment management information. And we've referred to this sometimes as NASI. So if you hear NASI, that is the National Offshore Sand Inventory, because it's a little bit of a tongue twister <laughs> to say the full name. Um, and I like this wheel here, the determine need, acquire data, analyze results, and share findings. So I'm gonna, uh, on the next few slides, I'll be walking through each of these steps in a little more detail. We're not gonna go fully in depth just for uh, time's sake, but um, hopefully I'll answer a few questions that you may have on this. And the uh, map here on the right just shows a few of our uh, NASI focus areas, and that's what the pink shows. And then the um, yellow are counties that are identified as priority areas. So we'll go ahead and move to our first little um, part on the wheel, which is determined need. So um, as Jessica mentioned, we know there is an increasing demand, um, but where is the sand? That's kind of the question that we, we need to ask. And there have been several studies to look into this and identify uh, where there's a need for sand and where we um, have resources available or, um, or where there are data gaps. And so that's what the map here on the right shows. It's a little similar to the one I showed you before, but goes into more detail. So you can imagine the red would be areas where you may have a high need, limited resources or um, limited, I guess, data gaps for those resources. And then green would be areas where maybe we um, know there's resources or there's a lower need. Um, and then this graph here on the bottom, um, the x-axis is showing year, so time going forward. The y-axis on the left is the number of leases, number of leases signed. And then the uh, right y-axis is showing the quantity of sand. And what you can see is that there's those true two trend lines and we see um, a continual increase over the years. And uh, Jessica touched on kind of some of the reasons for that. Um, and it's really important that we um, understand where we have a need for these um, sand resources. Um, and yeah, so I'll move back, move on to the acquired data. So we've determined a need in an area. The next step would be to acquire data. Um, and so we do this via geophysical surveys and geological surveys. This is a little uh, cartoon just showing some of the equipment 
um, that we use and more importantly, what we learn from that. And so when we're acquiring data, um, we're trying to fill these data gaps and learn for a particular area. Um, in our geophysical surveys, we're looking at surface sediment, bottom elevation, uh, cultural resources. And you can think of this as kind of the, um, just the seafloor, understanding what is present. And then um, another aspect of that is sub bottom. So looking a little bit below the surface, but an important note for marine minerals is we're just looking very shallow. We're not going deep. It's not like oil and gas, um, really just understanding what is uh, at the bottom surface. And then uh, we also do geological surveys. So this is looking at what is actually present. So this would be our fiber cores, benthograbs to actually uh, understand what that sediment looks like. Okay, and then we can move on to the next slide. And so um, here we're looking at analyzing results and sharing findings. So Jessica shared the dashboard for the Marine Minerals Information System. And um, this is a great resource for us. So it is an interactive online uh, tool with GIS mapping capabilities and it is publicly accessible. So like Jessica said, anyone can go on and it includes over 30 years of data from um, various government agencies, uh, academia, other private entities. And it also does link directly to our environmental studies. Um, and it has a lot of information. I think for this slide, looking at that third column that has MMIS going up the side, it includes um, bathymetry, environmental data, those bottom characteristics, and then planning, which Jessica will go into the multi-use aspects um, in one of the next sections, but um, it's a really great resource to have all of this data in one spot. Okay, we can move to the next. So I have two quick examples. Um, this one is in Texas, and the main takeaway here is that this is an area where there is a lack of data and increasing storm frequency has triggered the need for resources. So this is an area where BOEM was able to partnership with, or partner with the state and the Army Corps to collect information for planning. And this also goes back to those partnerships being a key role um, in BOEM planning. And then the next example is um, very interesting and different because it is an area where we um, know that there's a high need, but we also know that there are limited resources. So there's been a lot of uh, research in this area. Um, there's a lot of projects that are anticipated and many different stakeholders with, you can imagine different timelines, needs, resources, um, all of the um, resources that we've identified may not be uh, viable options for these projects. And so this is an example where that regional planning is really critical. And I like the graphic on the right, because <laughs> you can see at the top, you have four people um, identifying a resource and they're all fighting over this one bucket of sand. And that's perhaps not the right way <laughs> to do things. Whereas the image below that, you have um, four people very happy with their own buckets of sand. Um, and that's what we're working, to, working towards, that proactive sediment management um, for sustainable coastal resilience. All right, we can move on. Okay, so we're moving on to the environmental stewardship section and we have a true or false trivia question here. The Bowen Marine Minerals Program uses science to facilitate use of resources, assess impacts, resolve conflicts, and inform decisions. Any guesses? True, I heard, of, I heard a few truths. It's not a trick question. <laughs> so yes, that one is true. <laughs> um, and so that's what I've identified here in these first few um, bullets. So we identify and facilitate the use of resources, ensure understanding of how our decisions impact the environment, and then resolve conflicts between the two if they arise. And the goal is to understand possible impacts from our projects 
and then apply appropriate mitigation measures. And I really like this um, circle here just because it shows kind of the ongoing uh, never ending cycle of environmental science informing environmental assessment, going back to inform our science um, while also um, sharing this information with the public, um, gathering that information, any public input that there may be and um, using the information from these assessments to inform our decision documents. So um, all of this, and then all of this goes to environmental stewardship in the middle. So it's all linked and uh, you'll see that in the next few slides as well. Um, so I think this was touched on just a little bit earlier, um, but there is a rigorous study selection process, especially in our uh, small but mighty marine minerals uh, program. We um, identify topics of study and then we work together to refine those and identify what priorities are. And this is through a peer review process internally um, and then with the studies program as well. And there are various procurement options. So interagency agreements, cooperative agreements, competitive contracts. And the key thing with um, all of these is that partnerships are critical. So without the US Geological Survey, um, partnerships with academia, professors, students, and then of course private um, entities as well, we would have a really hard time completing our research. So that's a key aspect of our program. And then we use that science to inform our decisions and environmental compliance which I know we've mentioned a lot, uh, brings me to the next slide. Um, and so just to briefly touch on this again, um, I know Bill talked about this earlier, but specific to um, our BOEM actions, marine, marine minerals program actions, the, these are just a few of the environmental regulations that we're required to comply with, but these are some of the ones that are triggered more frequently. So the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, is um, kind of the big one. We call that the umbrella law. And then um, all of these other ones we have to comply with as well. So Endangered Species Act, Executive Order for Environmental Justice, Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which is important, especially um, for essential fish habitat. And then all of these other ones as well. Um, and to show how this relates to our studies. Um, I think it was in the video earlier, but essentially we can propose a study um, if we know a, an endangered species may be in our project area, we could propose a study to learn more about their movement. And if we learn that they're not present in the winter time, we can create mitigation so that we don't, don't conduct work during that time frame. Um, so the goal is to inform decisions comply with our requirements under these laws and make science-based uh, decisions. Okay, we can move on to the next. And these are some of the research disciplines. And um, if you notice on the last slide, um, these kind of, these relate to a lot of the laws that you saw on the last slide. So social science and economics, air quality, um, there's several on habitat and um, species. Uh, protected species, fates and effect, physical sciences and cultural resources. So um, these are all just some of the possible uh, study areas. And then of course our studies are available um, for public access on the BOEM website. Next slide. All right, and then one last example here just to give an idea of um, some of the studies that we do. So this is ecological function and recovery of sand shoals following repeat dredge events. This particular study is off of Cape Canaveral um, and a partnership with uh, several entities on the bottom. And the goal here is to understand the potential impacts and recovery of a shoal following dredging of these shoal systems. And so these are really important for our program, as you can imagine, because it can give us an idea of what um, what a shoal area may be either prior to dredging or in a control site, and then monitor how uh, a shoal area recovers after dredging. So several of these are multi-year ongoing studies um, and they can help us understand what is happening in these dredging areas. 
All right. And with that, I will pass it back over to Jessica. All right. I think we're in the home stretch. Only a few more slides. Um, so, I, yep, we got it that it's being recorded. Sorry, I have a message here that popped up. Um, so, uh, this one is a little bit of an unfair question because we're not giving you all of the information, but it's a pretty mind blowing uh, stat. So, economic impact, let's talk dollars here um, of leaving a thousand meter pipeline on Ship Shoal, which, um, just for reference, is about three meters thick. Um, so, thousand meter pipeline, three meters worth of sand buried by the pipeline. Any idea what a dollar amount, say, to the state would be? Wild guesses are wonderful. Nothing, no guesses. How about our MMP people? Anybody actually know this in the MMP group? Half a billion dollars. Oh, all right. Well, let's go with half a billion. How do we think Paul did here? So rough estimate, we're talking about $37.8 million. Now um, that is from the state of Louisiana. So that's very specific to the state, but Anna and Dina are actually gonna be talking later this afternoon, I believe specifically about that calculation and how you get that because I 100% did not give you enough information to get that number yourself. But, hmm? Yeah, so um, pipeline regulations for oil and gas is that they're supposed to be buried at least three meters. Um, so that would be, uh, the three meters is, that, or three feet, excuse me, I'm misspeaking now. Um, but the thickness of the shoal, that's kind of the one of the deeper portions of, of ship shoal. So obviously, certainly thickness of the shoal varying would change the, the value on that. But um, I, if you're really curious about that, uh, on a grill on and Dina about it later. So I'm going to, I'm going to punt that one to them. All right. Next one. Uh, last trivia question for this session or for this section, what types of activities do we currently coordinate with to deconflict resource areas? So we're switching into multi-use coordination. All of them. Is there one that we don't do all of them? Any other thoughts? Question mark? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yep. So let's go ahead and show the answer. You're right, sir. We do not do green hydrogen. Yep. Um, so we do currently coordinate with the other four green hydrogen. Um, not at this point, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that on the horizon. Um, so let's go ahead and transition. Um, so in case everyone has not gotten the message yet, um, partnerships are really critical to this program. Um, and that holds true for multi-use planning as well. Um, we need it to leverage investments. We need it to locate sand resources. We need it to manage conflicts, execute research, um, and exchange information, which I'm going to focus on just a little bit for this section. Um, our partnerships do vary greatly. You know, the federal, state, county, we've talked about tribes, certainly universities, absolutely. Um, we also have a lot of national organizations that we work with, as well as some regional planning bodies like the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, for example. I'm Gulf centric, so I'm going to reference them. Um, but we need them to help us identify where these priorities are, right? Since BOEM isn't building these projects, we need to rely on others to, to communicate what they're seeing on their horizon, where we anticipate additional needs, um, what they need um, that we might be able to support or help with. Um, and ultimately all of that leads to characterizing these resources, reducing and mitigating conflicts, um, and then managing those resources for long-term sustainability. Let's go ahead and scroll on. Um, MMIS, I'm just going to come back to this one because while we talked about MMIS was accessible to the public, um, it is amazing how much MMIS is used and collaborated with with others. So this is just a sampling of the various ways the data from MMIS is utilized, um, accessed, shared, collaborated with. Um, it's led to some really amazing um, coordination efforts for surveys and data collection, um, which has been wonderful. Um, and it's also been a really great tool for us internally in evaluating particularly like ca cable routing for renewables or oil and gas pipelines that may be coming in or going out, um, 
having all that information in one place and having this network of data um, with others has been um, absolutely critical. And it wasn't that long ago that we ha like didn't have this. So for us, this is still really new and really exciting. Um, you know, it just went public, I think, in 2019. So for us, this is this is a big deal. Um, let's go ahead and transition forward. So the example that you see, just to kind of take it all in, this is um, New England, New Jersey, I believe, um, looking at some possible OCS lease areas and um, transmission cable routes. Um, you can probably just barely see it, but there's some yellow and some orange that indicate um, sediment resources. So certainly you're gonna be looking at cables going through these areas. How do you navigate deconflicting that and making sure that industry still moves forward, but resources are guarded? Um, as much as possible. That takes a lot of conversations. Um, so we do coordinate across industries as well as um, the other entities I'd mentioned, particularly oil and gas, renewables, certainly. The Atlantic has been taking the lead for the last handful of years on coordinating our minerals needs with the renewables um, side of both our agency and external. Carbon sequestration is coming on board, certainly in the Gulf, that's a factor that we're looking at. Um, we also have the, the commercial elements, fishing, aquaculture, that we all try to work with and live in harmony with. Um, but to do that, I, the phrase that I always tend to use is you can't manage what you don't know you have. <laughs> so at the end of the day, if you don't know you have those resources, it makes it very difficult to manage, which is why NASI that Victoria talked about is so um, important for our program. Like we need to identify those areas provide a structured data <laughs> management system and accessibility to that information, um, and then getting that information or identified needs from our partners and stakeholders. Um, you know, work, work together pulling in the same direction. So I'm gonna use the Gulf of Mexico as an example of just how busy it can be or can get. Um, this certainly is not all activities happening in the Gulf, but you'll get the gist, I think, pretty quick. Um, so for us, we, we do have to manage proactively. So we really do need to be at the planning stage of activities um, to help ensure that there is availability or that the, uh, the impact to those other activities are limited or restrained in some way um, that still allows access to these sediment resources that we're managing. Um, for the Gulf of Mexico in particular, every OCS identified borrow area, so every construction project that we have has pipelines that are bounding the limits of that borrow area, meaning it can expand. It's a very specific area. Um, a slight nuance to dredging is the more turns a dredge makes, the more costly it gets because they can't actually be operating while they're making those turns. So the smaller you restrict an area, the more oddly you shape it, the more expensive it gets. Um, so for the Gulf, at least, there's no borrow area that's not restricted or limited in some capacity by um, industry um, equipment. Um, and there's about 1,200 pipelines identified in sediment areas. So those gray areas on the uh, map are areas where we have identified potential sediment resources um, that may be viable for use for coastal restoration projects. Um, some of them still need to be verified a little bit more, but um, you get the gist. Like we're, we've flagged those as an area that we're watching and trying to coordinate around. And you've also got wind energy coming on board, particularly off the coast of Texas, um, and then oil and gas industry activity, which has been in the Gulf for a very long time at this point. Um, so just to get a sense of scale on how busy it can get. Let's go ahead and move forward. So to kind of transition and close out, we've talked a lot about partnerships. We've talked about resource uh, evaluation in the form of resource stewardship, environmental stewardship, um, and all of that leading to this ultimate goal of coastal resilience um, and, and making sure that Bowen's at the table supporting um, these resilience efforts through facilitated access to these sediment resources. Um, and all of that leads ultimately to informed decision making by us and by our partners, right? We don't work in a silo. So um, all of it leads to the best decisions we can possibly make with the information that we have at the time. 
And so with that, I'll go ahead and close out. Um, I'm not gonna repeat these. These are the ones that Bill showed earlier, um, <laughs> formatted in a slightly different way since he borrowed that slide. Um, <laughs> um, but I'll pause here. We can take a few questions and then we do have time. We have some case study activities for y'all. So um, maybe we can take a handful of questions. Pause. Sure, quite. Uh, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, okay. Hi there. I mean, the overall program is great, but um, having worked in sand for a while, given that um, we don't really know at a fine scale what's living on any little spot in the in the atlas, given that sand communities are highly dynamic and yet they have this weirdness of sometimes taking a long time to recover. Um, there must be a lot of uncertainty. So, I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty. How do you guys handle that? Because the, generally you really have a deep understanding of the dynamics, but specifically, we don't know what the biology is on any one spot and we don't know what it's gonna be in 10 years or would have been. Yeah, uh, spot on assessment of that, I agree. Um, we do the best we can, obviously, to understand kind of the broader perspective of what's happening, what may be there. I think Don, uh, Dina and Anna, correct me if I'm wrong, y'all are going to touch maybe a little bit on some of this this afternoon from the environmental side of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think at this point we try and look at the trends that we're seeing elsewhere and then make... Um, connections that way in the event that we're not able to actually collect data um, real time in the moment. Um, we have a few areas that we know are going to be unique, more unique than you would probably anticipate and are proactive in trying to go out and make sure we collect particularly pre-dredged data um, when we can in advance. But it's, it's just with the scale that we're working at and the different areas, it would be hard to do that for every single location. Um, we do, um, with a lot of the partnerships that we have, particularly with the lead agencies, they also have a lot of the same responsibilities that we do, particularly in regards to environmental compliance. Um, so we, we do have the ability to work with them to a large extent in advance of these projects to identify where there might be gaps where we need to backfill and gather data and information. And, and in some cases, they've already done a lot of that in, in some of their pre-planning coordination efforts. The core is a good example of that. I don't know if anyone else, Weichel, or anyone wants to say anything else about that or if that's good, good, okay. On, on that point, can you say a little bit more about your relationship with the, the core uh, on the OCS when it, in regard to sand and who sort of takes the lead? And um, I mean, they obviously are, are, are taking the sand and they have their own permitting requirements under sort of some, some combination of the rivers and harbors and the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, the extension. So how, how, does, that, how does that all work? And um, particularly in, in the context of looking at some of these difficult environmental effects questions. Yeah, great question. You know, every district's gonna have a slightly different relationship with us, but um, for the most part, we do work essentially as a team on these projects. So the core, if, if the core is the lead, say it's a civil works project, um, they will take point on all of the environmental components. The only piece that they can't do because it falls under Boehm's jurisdiction is the the access to the to the borrow area that they want to use. Um, so when that happens, we typically sign on as a joint action agency and then move forward with them. Um, so that it's essentially one federal action, even though there's two agencies or more um, that are involved and have jurisdictional responsibilities. The regulatory side of, of the core relationship is a little bit different, but similar in that, say, if it's the state, I'm going to use Louisiana as an example, say the state's building a project, they have to go to the Corps of Engineers to get a permit for the project. Um, Typically at that point, we will have been working with the state for years in advance of the core ever kind of even being tapped, right? To put all the information together, collect all the 
um, science data, put the plans together. Um, so at that point, we then coordinate with the regulatory side of the core to say, look, like we have all these, all of these same requirements and expectations. Let's again work jointly on this so that it's issued. We still have our own kind of decision documents and we have our own lease that's issued that doesn't get ingested into their process, but everything that leads up to that can be done jointly, public notices and announcements. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but it is a pretty integrated, we've worked a lot on that relationship with the core understanding that there's a lot of synergies and overlap with responsibilities with them. So I've developed a, a pretty decent system for um, generating kind of a unified federal um, action when it comes to these projects at OCS borrow areas. Uh, so I, I see it. Jack's got his, his card up, but just before we jump in there, uh, a point of clarification on your map. Can you, you can't mine in an area you've designated for wind farms though, right? Can you, uh, is that a conflict or, or are you able to, to do both in, in that area? Is someone that's handling that right now would like to take that? Yeah, maybe I'll take a first swipe at it. <clears throat> I think if uh, uh, you could, as long as it doesn't interfere with the uh, wind farm activity, is that potentially a correct answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we do have to provide easements and right of ways for the, the offshore wind activities and the infrastructure. And that's why it's critical that we understand where the resources are prior to those construction and operation plans coming across our desk for evaluation, um, kind of doing it after the fact isn't helpful because then the infrastructure is already there and we're limited um, you know, that 37, whatever 0.8 million at a time would be a consequence. So it or potentially larger depending on how big the cable is. I would, I would think so because there's requirements there with the, how, how deep it's buried and the crisscross of the electronic cables and the, the, the structure. Yeah, it must be complicated. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, Jack Barth, Oregon State. Just quick clarification, then my real question. So uh, can you borrow from state waters or are we talking offshore of that? So state waters falls outside of our scope. So if, if they have a state borrow area, they there's there's not really any, unless they just want our support and advice and, and input as experts in that topic, they don't need a lease or anything okay. from us. We do have some projects that have both a state borrow component as well as a federal one, which creates an interesting um, coordination dynamic. But um, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's state <coughs> borrow resources, we're not typically involved okay. with those. Thanks. Can you talk about how the money works? <laughs> I, I didn't hear anything about who pays the lease, who gets the money, on and on and on. Yeah, uh, great question. So the way that um, OSLA is written, if it's for the purposes kind of outlined in 8K, the coastal resiliency components essentially are funded in whole or in part built by um, federal, state, local entities, um, then there's actually no charge to them to get the OCS materials. Obviously, whatever the costs are associated with the work they need to put into to providing everything they need to get a lease from us, right, is incorporated into project costs. But as far as like paying for a cubic yard of material from the OCS, if they meet the requirements, then it's not um, necessary. And I think Jeff mentioned, we do have a, a commercial component of the regs where we could charge depending on like if it's used for a different purpose than what's outlined for this non-competitive um, piece but we actually haven't had any commercial leases for aggregates or sand and gravel at this point i was thinking back to the budget question about the 33 percent of the personnel costs that you paid can you get any money for that no that uh that Personnel cost comes out of our uh, out of our internal budget. There was I'm sorry, the, uh, Jeff Ridenauer. I keep forgetting to say who I am. Yeah, Jeff Ridenauer with Bell. So there was a, a few years back uh, interest in cost recovery since we we don't charge for the sand. So uh, uh, one of the administrations wanted us to look into some cost recovery potential, and uh, that was a component maybe looking at. How much how much time we spend processing and uh, you know doing the actual leasing activity, but then never came to fruition. 
Would it be okay for us to um, transition to leave time for some? Um... Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a question online, although it, uh, I don't believe he's a committee member. Um, so we're just, I want to make sure the committee members have a chance to, to ask all, all the questions first. Yeah. I also think, I'm, I don't have the, cal the agenda in front of me right now, but is there open time? This after, I can't remember if it's today or tomorrow that there's open time. So if we can't get to everybody's questions um, in the interest of being able to do this study, we can always um, circle back to these questions at the open session. Great. Um, and yeah, Ruth, you have your, you wanna have a quick? Yeah, thank you for that. It was a great overview. <clears throat> um, some of the activities that BOEM is responsible for, offshore wind, oil and gas, I know you incorporate quite a bit of the oil and gas mapping information, habitat characterization. How are you set up to do that for offshore wind, given that there's pretty high resolution um, mapping happening, benthic resource, et cetera, um, that gives pretty strong coverage for the East Coast? Um, just how do you what's the ability of the team to incorporate a lot of that information and do so earlier? And then is there a feedback mechanism if there's areas identified, particularly in New Jersey is a great example, to where that may come back and impact BOEM's approvals of or planning for offshore wind um, in terms of the right of ways and easements? Just curious how that system works. Um, and then maybe my last question is, um, <clears throat> how are you working with states that are looking at regional transmission corridor planning and things like that in terms of balancing sand sediment resource availability? So I can try to cover a piece of that. Um, I think to answer part of the question, I think one important aspect of our program is we are coordinating with wind, but as far as the area where the projects are occurring, the wind, I believe, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, is further offshore. So as far as like that overlap, that it's more so the cables that are um, more of an impact for us that we're coordinating. Um, and that will be part of our case study will be, um, one of the groups will be discussing that. And then I believe that might be discussed later as well. Um, but then, there was another part of the question. Victoria, Victoria, I'll jump in. This is Jeff Weichel from Boom. Hi, Ruth. It's been a long time. Nice to see you. Um, so there are enormous um, geological and geophysical data sets, particularly on the Atlantic seaboard, that are of wide interest across government, not just to Boom and its mission areas, but also USGS and geological framework studies, uh, NOAA, and some other federal agencies for their NOMEC uh, seafloor characterization um, initiative, and Department of Energy as well. So there are ongoing conversations about how to make that data available for its multiple purposes that exist now, uh, but could exist. And I'll say it's a little bit complicated because of kind of confidentiality provisions um, that are associated with the renewable energy regulations. In offshore, some states, some states have been proactive and the states themselves funded uh, that data, I think uh, Maryland and Delaware come to mind, and those data assets have been put out into the public domain. And uh, for example, our colleagues at Woods Hole at USGS have analyzed that data to create integrated uh, seamless inner shelf um, habitat maps that are great and have multiple uses for, for people downstream. Um, some of the uh, operators off of New Jersey in comparison those have been capital investments by those operators and there are governing requirements of the regulations that basically make that data confidential up to a point at which operation starts and then they become uh, pu publicly available. Uh, there are um, entities in federal and state government that um, are talking about how we may work uh, with industry and those confidentiality provisions to make that data available for environmental purposes, uh, but we haven't threaded the needle on, on that topic yet, but it's one that we're very, very, um, very, very interested in. Um, and so to, to some extent, Boehm, when we do our reviews of looking at potential space use conflicts between what really are the export cables and, and inner shelf sand resources or sediment resources, it's, we, we do kind of like a public data review, and then we do a, a, 
a, pri a private data review. So we work very closely with the operators um, to, to figure out how, uh, how we do that how we do that best. But, but ultimately there have been case examples where we had information or they had information that resulted in a rerouting of a proposed export cable um, because it made sense. Um, uh, but there have also have been instances where there, we have sacrificed sand resources because the investment, um, there, there was no alternative or the investment for data acquisition was, was significant. I mean, there's many, many millions of dollars um, going into these GNG surveys. Uh, the footprint is enormous. Um, you know, so you're talking, some of these are half the state, half the size of the state of Delaware in comparison, like a borough area that ultimately gets leased is maybe a 10th of a lease block. Uh, so there's a, a, a significant scale difference. And I'll add the complexity of just the sheer volume, the size of these data sets, you know, any given offshore wind survey, we're talking 18 terabytes, T terabytes, um, and just how do you manage that internally? Is a big challenge that we're trying to address, particularly with the Department of Inter not Department of Energy, and we're part of Interior, and others across um, government are moving to the cloud environment, and so going from on-premise systems and servers to the cloud with very limited data centers that are managing all of this. Um, there's two now for the whole Department of Interior, um, the egress in and out from workstations um, is there's a cost for every single time you do that. So we're just starting to wrap our brains around what that actually means for us, which is going to further constrain our budgets to be able to do operations. So it's it's something that we're definitely keeping our eye on. And I guess just to kind of wrap that one up, um, as far as the coordination, we haven't brought up one of our other partners, which is important. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, we do work really closely with them as well. Um, especially for our oil and gas um, stuff happening in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, in areas where there's activities proposed, whether that be install or removal um, that are in any of those identified sediment resource areas that we have flagged, they'll work with us to get our input so that we can evaluate data resources information. And, and Jeff kind of alluded to it, but um, similar to the renewables side, um, operators now are are willing, in some cases, to collect data to provide to us to support the decision making process. Um, you know, we we try and work with them as closely as possible to to make sure that you know we're making good recommendations back to Bessie, who ultimately has to decide how to um, how to move forward with with whatever actions being requested. But we do work really closely with Bessie as well. Line. Oh, sorry. We do have a question online uh, from Ken um, Brishi. I hope I pronounced that right. Go, go ahead, Ken. Thank you. And apologies if I'm not sure following exact protocol as I'm not a committee member. I am um, counsel for the North American Submarine Cable Association, NASCA, and we have had very productive discussions uh, with BOEM in the past across all of its programs with protection of submarine fiber optic cable networks. Um, but I did not see among uh, coordination with industries lists um, so far mention of submarine fiber optic networks. Those are all the pink lines uh, on uh, that map that was shown. And so as an industry, we would very much like to continue that collaborative interaction that we have had uh, with BOEM, we would also like to see the cable layer added back to MMIS. It appears to have been removed. Um, and so it's not actually possible in MMIS to plot submarine fiber optic networks right now. Um, submarine cables, of course, are typically routed in areas where there is, as the industry would see it, boring, flat, sandy seabed, which is often uh, where borrow areas are located. Um, and so the recovery from a borrow area is an issue both with in that phase, but also with the replenishment. It's not just with um, with recovery of sand, but also with vessels and anchors and the like with beach replenishment projects in, in particular. So thanks for considering that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, do you want to proceed with your... Uh... I'm not sure what it, what do you have an interactive. Uh, um, one second, real quick. So, 
I think so we don't have too much time. We have about 15 minutes. So I think what we may do is um, the activity that we have is three different case study scenarios. So some of them have to do with um, these cables. Some of them may have to do with endangered species. So we're gonna break into three groups, but I think since we're close to lunchtime, perhaps we kind of close out here, break into our groups for 10 to 15 minutes and then leave from there if that's logistically okay with everybody. Or do we, we can come back here. Yeah, the, the only thing I'm uh, <laughs> uh, worried about with it a little bit is the people online won't be able to. Oh yes, sorry. So online, we do have a PowerPoint slide so there will be a case study um, for them to participate independently. And then we'll ask, there's instructions on the PowerPoint. So um, that will be displayed while we break into groups. So this part would be kind of um, independent from the online aspect, but there will be an opportunity for anyone online um, to put comments into the chat. And then the hope is that we can capture all of those comments um, for internal consideration. <laughs> so yeah. all right well uh, yeah sure hey. we wanted to get everybody uh moving a little bit and kind of break from the class sorry classic sitting or um around looking at powerpoint presentations so um just yeah it'll just be a, a little activity before we break for lunch and um paul and shannon are going to be two of our leaders i will be the third so i think shannon do you have one Yours is number one, right? Okay, so Paul is number one, Shannon is number two, I am number three. So I think we're gonna count off one, two, three, um, getting really fun here. And then there's, I believe there's a sitting area out front and then maybe we can have two groups stay in here. Um, so I'll, I'll say group three will be out in that sitting area and we'll repeat this after I count everybody off. What are the instructions? Yeah, short, short period of time, 1230 cut off, right? Yes, so you're going to, you're, there are two printouts that your leaders will have and they'll read the scenario. And then the goal is everybody um, discuss within your group kind of some considerations. So um, it, it has sort of instructions on there, like in this scenario, discuss what you would do if you were the responsible party in this situation. And so there's no right or wrong answers. There, maybe there potentially in real life would be a wrong answer, but for the purpose of this example, we really just want you to start brainstorming. If you have expertise in this area, please contribute um, that aspect of it. It's also just an opportunity to um, meet your fellow BOEM and COSA members. Um, and so, yeah, are there any questions? You'll have your leader in your group. So there's, it's low stakes. Okay. All right, we'll all start counting people off then. Yeah, so for those of you online, we just put up the optional case study activity. Um, this is also your opportunity to run away if you wish not uh, to do this. And then we can you just follow the schedule and we should be back at two o'clock. Yep. Two o'clock, um, yeah. Yep. So, um, but if you have, uh, if you guys want to talk online, you're more than welcome to, but we didn't want you to feel obligated. And we know there's a lot of you online. So um, we would love any ideas or thoughts or concepts for this virtual case that we've provided for you to drop them in the chat because we will collect those and we're going to do a brief out when there's time available, maybe later in the week um, to talk about some of the points that were brought up for this case study. But if you want to run away, now is the time to do it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, thanks. Back. I hope. Hope everyone had a great lunch and uh, yeah. Um, to start us off, Jeff is going to make a few few remarks. Please. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, Jeff, uh, Jeff Ridenour with Boehm. Yeah, so the next session, uh, we're gonna be talking about data needs. So environmental studies and sand resource characterization are closely linked for uh, many of our decisions. Environmental studies provide information on physical processes and ecology, uh, sand quality, volume, location, and demand are critical uh, to our understanding of the value of the sand and the sediment uh, to beach nourishment projects. And environmental and resource uh, value, among other factors, guide our stewardship decisions, including multi-use planning. And much of the information supporting these decisions come from strong partnerships. That's a common theme throughout uh, all these talks that we're giving. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anna Rice and then uh, tag teaming it with Dina Hansen. So, Anna. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. As Jeff said, my name is Anna Rice. I'm a physical scientist. I have an oceanography background and I work in the Marine Minerals Program in Gulf of Mexico region. It's a pleasure to be here. So yes, uh, thank you, Jeff, for those uh, remarks. Um, I will start off uh, the presentation with some background and context about decision-making. So we'll go over some kind of how do we come up with our study ideas, how to apply these studies. Then Dina will, uh, focus on the status quo of environmental, of environmental studies with a focus on ecological value. Um, and then we will uh, take a, a quick break. She will do some discussion. Um, and then after the break, I will come back and finish it off. Uh, I will be focusing on resource stewardship in the context of multi-use planning. One more thing after this, these introductory slides, we're gonna take a, probably a five minute break just to see if we can get any questions answered. And then I will, um, um, and then Dina will, will take over. So uh, in the MMP 101, um, a lot of information was shared there. So really all the content that we're sharing here um, was already introduced and we're just gonna be taking a deeper dive into some of the concepts. All right, so this slide in a way summarizes the content of this combined presentation. So you'll see the three bullets there. And then we have a question. Oh, thank you, sorry. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, we have a question there that we want to keep up um, just for this slide here. We will come back to this at the end of my discussion section at the very end of the presentation. But we wanted you to see it here because it kind of combines what we're going to be talking about um, today. So a few things that I want to uh, define uh, before we get started. Um, you've probably heard us talk about sand and sediment, gravel. Um, it's all interchangeable here, right, because we manage all of it. Um, the second thing that I want to mention is that decisions, which is the overarching topic of this specific presentation, are made internally and externally, um, and they, be, they may be negotiated or not, and they vary dep depending on the type of project. Um, and then value. So value uh, of a sand resource can be characterized in many, many ways. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on resource value, which uh, is often driven by the quality, volume, and demand of, the, of sand. And then we're also going to be diving into the ecological value. That's going to be what Dina is going to be focusing on. Um, and then um, in tomorrow's uh, coastal resilience presentation, we're, we're going to be uh, focused more on uh, stakeholder perspectives and social values. All right. So with regards to that first bullet, the resource value uh, and ecology uh, value are both important, both at the project scale and for multi-use planning. Decisions rely on both ecological factors and economic drivers. Um, and the research uh, that we conduct is to support decisions based on gaps uh, and recommendations. Okay. And then I'll read off the question, just so you can keep it in the back of your mind. How do we combine ecological and resource stewardship to better conserve sand and sediment during multi-use planning? So as you can see, it kind of combines what, we're, what Dina and I are gonna be talking about today. All right, so let's begin with some background or context uh, that we feel is necessary to kind of lay the groundwork of this presentation. So first is what kind of decisions uh, does 
MMP make. So we can, uh, the decisions can be broken up into three broad categories. So leasing, you know, this is through our dredge projects. Uh, these are uh, negotiations between BOEM and our project proponent. Uh, as Jessica mentioned earlier, um, the core is usually the, the agency that constructs our projects. So we do a lot of negotiating uh, with them. Uh, we have a lot of environmental com uh, compliance during our leasing. So mitigation measures are also uh, a big one. These requirements are provided by other agencies and then executed by BOEM. And then we have the conflicting decisions that we need to make. So this is negotiation with the BOEM uh, and industry. So oil and gas, wind energy, and so forth, um, and other agencies. Okay, next slide. All right, so the goal of our studies uh, is always to help inform uh, the type of decisions that I just discussed. So it's important to know uh, how we come up with these study ideas. We have three broad categories. Again, uh, the first is assessments. And by assessments, we don't just mean um, environmental compliance assessments, but all types of assessments. So internally, um, MMP uh, SMEs uh, may identify gaps during assessments, like NEPA or biological uh, assessments, EFH assessments. Um, internally, uh, through forecasting. So if we expect a new area to be dredged, we may choose to invest in pre-dredged research. So the Brian Panschel study, which you, some of you may be familiar familiar with is a perfect example of that. Um, and also from external resource management agencies. So during consultations, uh, resource management agencies uh, may provide mitigation measures uh, and may identify gaps, which then MMP can use uh, as research ideas. And then the last, and then a stakeholder and partner engagement, again, a common theme throughout this presentation, we get a lot of our study ideas from our external um, partners. And then the last category is from other studies. So sometimes literature reviews that recommend priority or, or areas of research. Um, and sometimes, you know, our studies can be divided into two uh, phases. So the first phase of a field study review uh, may uh, lead to a development of, of a new methodology. All right, our assessments uh, rely on study results. Sorry, next slide. Um, so uh, there was recently uh, ESP uh, funded a uh, review on how studies inform assessments and decisions. This is also known as a feedback loop study, uh, Kaufman et al. Uh, 2023. So it was recently uh, published. Uh, and the main conclusion here uh, was that the ratio of BOEM assessments that cite at least one BOEM product, uh, product over time, this is for all of BOEM, was on average 75%. Um, now for MMP, that ratio is a little bit higher, 79%. Um, and here we show some examples uh, of assessments. So uh, usually we try to uh, integrate results into project specific NEPA. Um, that's kind of like the general sense. Um, also, we created a NIMS approved EFH assessment template that incorporates new more accurate uh, fish distribution models. Uh, so this uh, led to better conference and outcomes with essential fish habitat consultations. Next slide. All right, our study results are also uh, applied externally through our partners. Um, and these are just some examples of, 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 of how our partners apply our studies. So operators, uh, sometimes uh, MMP SMEs have used guidance provided uh, by operators in real time to decrease risk containment of sea turtles, as an example. Um, through our external uh, decision makers, so the Mid-Atlantic Data Portal houses MMIS and shoal layers, and you can see that uh, map of the shoal layers uh, on the right there. Uh, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council uh, policy cites some bone funded research. Um, also, going back to that feed loop study, the recommendation was to improve stakeholder awareness and accessibility of study or assessment. And this is all across the board. Um, now, uh, MMP, we feel like we do this very well, of course, but there's always uh, some room for improvement. All right, again, common theme, partnership and stakeholder relationships. Our stakeholders and our partners not only use our study results, but they help generate ideas and execute research for both environmental and research stewardship. So uh, the various sources of information are critical uh, to our decision making. Um, here is just a, a, a small group of, uh, of partners uh, that we uh, you know, conduct work with or have a relationship with in the Marine Minerals Program. Um, so these uh, groups help us execute our research, leverage our investments, locate uh, sand research, manage conflicts, and exchange information. 
Next slide. All right, so that was it for kind of the background uh, to our presentation. So I'd like to pause here uh, for five minutes before turning it over to Dina. See if anybody has any questions or comments. <laughs> this is uh, this is Lori Suma. I'm not sure if this is a question for you or for Dina. But at some point, hopefully this afternoon, we can talk about, um, I think it's, I think it, you could describe it as the time value of the resource. So you have a lot of um, short term demands on the resource that require you to go out and dredge to fix something. And then there's sort of the more strategic issues of maintaining coastal resilience, which sometimes might not be, um, might not actually need dredging. And I think it would be interesting to talk about how you all balance those two long-term and short-term needs. Thanks. Thank you, that's a very good question. And I think we could probably save that for the discussion. Unless Dina, you have something to yeah, add? Um, hi, this is Dina Hansen. I, I think this is a, a very good question. It might be um, addressed slightly in the coastal resilience session tomorrow. Um, because that does dive deeper into planning, um, planning kind of farther ahead. But um, as was pointed out during the intro or the MMP 101, um, our lease uh, leases are usually only five years. So we are, um, there is a reactive phase as well, which, you know, finding that balance is something that I think we can know and talk about um, either later today when we have more time or definitely tomorrow during the coastal resilience session. But thank you for bringing that up. Uh, again, this may be for later, but um, it actually might be possible economically to survey uh, potential sand resource areas for their um, maturity, for the community maturity to avoid the ones that are very mature. Kevin is actually our expert on how to do that. Um, but has that been considered? And then sort of avoiding, like you said, avoiding the more mature. Yeah, areas. but re redo the survey regularly so that because every winter it changes the whole picture. So there, the sort of survey frequency um, varies project to project. Some sort, of, some projects don't have any um, biological monitoring associated with it. Um, so we do try to find that balance between, um, you know, active data collection for a survey versus interpreting what we know for other areas nearby. Um, but we don't always have the same data set for every project. Um, so we may not even know the maturity of a given site um, before dredging. And that, that could potentially go into decision-making, um, but as we'll talk about kind of at the very end of this, when we bring together habitat value and almost the economic side of it, those two things are sometimes in the same corner and sometimes they're actually conflicting with each other as you know. Um, so I think we'll probably come back to that point. If there are other questions, I'm going to turn it over to Dina, and she's going to talk about sand resource habitat value. Okay, my name is Dina Hansen. I mentioned before um, I work for Marine Minerals um, Division in headquarters, and I um, do a lot of environmental work, and um, particularly with sort of the um, fisheries ecology. Um, so today, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, Today, we're going to um, kind of focus in on one of our research themes. So in the MMP 101, you saw several different disciplines that our environmental studies will often pursue. Um, each one of those could be an entire COSA session. So um, I, I wanna just highlight one of our themes. And so today I'm gonna focus on kind of the benthic and fish um, ecology. And um, being around so many geologists, I have come to um, you know, accept wholeheartedly that that the biology is completely determined by the, not completely, it is determined by the physical and geological setting. And so by having our interdisciplinary team, it kind of helps um, us, it helps us biologists realize that coupling and it helps the geologists also understand more of the environmental concerns with each of our um, dredging projects and decisions. Um, this, uh, 
this sort of question of habitat value was brought to marine minerals program um, over years of consultations with NOAA fisheries and other resource management agencies. Um, there was always this question about kind of habitat value, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, there was this push to define it. And so over the last 10 to 15 years, um, marine minerals program has invested in trying to um, determine what does, you know, how do we determine value? How do we measure it? And then how do we track it, you know, before, after dredge projects? And then, um, you know, what a part of the concern was that there may, that dredging might constitute an irreversible change to the habitat value. But sometimes this was in a vacuum, not considering the environmental setting, the duration or timing of a project of a dredge, um, dredge activity. And so we wanted to also try to add that environmental context so, so that we could understand not just the pre-dredge setting, but also the responses, the resilience, and the potential for recovery. Um, so there we did have a couple cornerstone literature reviews um, happen about 10 years ago. Uh, and those kind of helped, uh, not only did they summarize what we know, our current state of knowledge on this sort of um, kind of benthic fish uh, physical set setting coupling, um, but it also provided a very comprehensive list of priorities and gaps. So that sort of set us up to then invest in those kind of piece by piece. And as we've done that over the last sort of 10 years, um, we're starting to get those results in. And now what we, what we wanna do kind of at this kind of juncture 10 years in is to synthesize, look at what we know, look at what we still don't know and kind of solicit your feedback on um, the kind of these questions. We're gonna bring these back up at the end of my session to think about um, when is it a good point to pivot? When do we continue to evolve? When do we keep ask, kind of studying the same question? Um, do we ever get saturated at a certain point where we need to um, kind of change lanes? And again, I know we've said it uh, multiple times now, but I just want to echo that the partnerships with academia, including our CSU networks, um, our federal partners, our NGOs, and um, the private industry are all integral in both the idea generation and execution of um, our environmental studies. Next slide. And so kind of getting back to this um, kind of foundational theme of the uh, physical and biological setting being coupled, uh, one of our uh, approaches to, to looking at this habitat value question was to characterize the ecology. And so when I uh, hear my geologists say resource evaluation to a biologist, I hear habitat characterization. And so when we think about that physical kind of basic setting, that lays the groundwork for the um, organisms that will be, you know, will hopefully colonize there. Um, so in, in characterizing this ecology, we've had a couple different kind of approaches to this. So we've done our best to quantify um, actually the coupling. We've created species distribution models, um, both on large and small scales, looking at multiple trophic levels and life stages, multiple species if we can. And um, you know, there is so much natural variation in systems that we do try to look at um, inter and, inter and in, intra-annual variability while we execute these studies. And when we think about the um, kind of relative value question, um, that kind of brings to mind comparisons. You know, we have to be able to, if we're talking, um, you know, valuing a system, we want to know what what are we comparing it to. So that might be. Um, you know, on a shoal, sort of a, a higher relief area versus a lower relief trough area, or compare to different, um, you know, same features, but different areas around, and then a dredged or undredged portion of a sandy bottom. Um, and then, of course, if we can, ideally, we would be able to measure changes in communities before, during, and after dredging. Um, there are surprising, there's a surprising number of challenges with this because the timing of a dredge project is not always certain. It is often tied to funding and that often changes or is delayed. Um, or if there's an emergency project, we don't always have time to get out there and do a full suite of um, monitoring studies before, uh, before an emergency lease is issued. And so when we, um, after looking at all these different methods, um, some of the, I'm gonna go over just some of the general results that we've started to get into. Um, so the next slide will show us our general habitat associations that were looking at, um, so kind of going from the benthic on up, um, as, as 
uh, probably a lot of the biologists know that the benthic community is influenced by the physical setting. And so that's the sediment composition, um, natural perturbations, and um, you know the bottom can be physically dominated, biologically dominated, or both. Um, and as uh, Les alluded to earlier, it's there are different sort of maturity levels. Some may be suspended in sort of an early successional stage just because there are a lot of natural um, storms and disturbances in that area. And that might be just normal for a certain system. And that's something that is helpful for us to know. Um, so just looking at some of our broad studies, um, we did note that off of Virginia, there wasn't particular um, habitat utilization for um, a lot of fishes, but abundance did increase on Sandy Bottom. And then in the South Atlantic off of um, the, the central coast of Florida, east central coast, uh, we saw that there were lower catches on high relief ridge, uh, ridges and more fish along the trough areas. Uh, but that the, there was a day to night difference as well. So there's some of these DL patterns that we um, need to pay attention to. Um, but a lot of the studies have kind of, uh, the results have pointed to the fact that oceanographic features and environmental factors like temperature, seasonality, um, distance from shore, stratification, these are often more influential on fish uh, presence and distribution compared to the presence of a geomorphological feature or a shoal or, um, or even the type of sediment on the bottom for what, for, for, especially for fish. And then um, looking at more of the individual shoal value on the next slide, um, we, we have tried to kind of uh, compare a shoal with sort of its surrounding neighborhood. Um, and so down in Florida, we saw that the fish composition, while there were some subtle differences among four different shoals, they were more similar than different. And so there was a, um, even with the dredged shoal, there was a com kind of commonality in the composition. Um, and then when we looked up off of Cape Cod Bay at the distribution of sand lance larvae, um, it was really important to not just look at the smaller area of influence because they have such a large distribution that the fish that originated on in Cape Cod Bay um, were potentially settling all the way off of Long Island, New York. And so even if you're looking at your impacts uh, in one footprint, you might they might be not even detectable except for very far. I'm going to get dinner at McDonald's. <laughs> Is that Jen? Um, so, so that's just one um, kind of point of, of uh, you know, making sure that, that, that we're not missing that blind spot. Um, and then uh, finally, so looking also, we uh, did some species distribution models, not just in the, um, we did the South Atlantic, Northern Gulf of Mexico. And you can see we, we created these heat maps um, like this of the white shrimp in the fall, where you can see kind of higher probability of occurrence. So using an internal BOEM tool, we were actually able to look at lease areas and specific shoal features and compare um, kind of the likelihood of shrimp occurrence. And so this is also kind of another way that we can hone in on a relative habitat value where you can see that Sabine Bank um, supports more, you know, is estimated to support more shrimp than Held Bank off of the coast of Texas. And then you can see both of those are a kind of relatively higher probability compared to the entire Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we're trying to find ways of looking at that relative habitat value um, both on a large and small um, scale. So we also have been looking at individual fish species on shoals in the next slide. Um, we modeled the, we used the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl data set, which is a very rich, very long running data set. And we modeled fish distribution relative to shoal features. And while we still saw this theme where the oceanographic factors were more influential on fish, di fish distribution, there, um, for some species, there was a small but significant effect to whether a shoal was there or not there. And so for the spring, we saw that winter flounder and little skate uh, were more likely to be found on a shoal. And then in the fall, there were uh, three pelagic species actually that were more likely to be found associated with a, a shoal. So it's, and that was also kind of illuminating because um, you know rough scat and um, striped anchovy for, for whatever reason, they're more likely to be on a shoal. And so that's that's not a demersal fish, it's not benthic oriented, but that's something that we need to um, kind of keep an eye out for as well. Um, we did notice off of the um, Cape Canaveral coast that there were two um, shark species that preferred deeper water. But besides that, the, the um, 
shallow water, meaning the kind of peak of a shoal and the seafloor slope did not correlate with any fish distribution. So those sort of other aspects that might define a shoal did not have any kind of significant correlation. And then in addition to looking at specific species, we've also looked at life stages. Um, so off of um, Gulf of Mexico, one of our um, biggest, most valuable sand resources is ship shoal. We've talked about a couple of times already. Um, it was found that blue crab were actually there having a protracted spawning period over the winter. Um, and now this is also very notable because this is an estuarine dependent species that's traveling all the way out to ship shoal miles from the coast. So there is a, a connectivity and um, you know inshore offshore link that um, could be very unique and very um, you know very relevant to management of this resource and um, the value of this habitat that it's not just for you know OCS critters. And also um, when we were back to looking at the sand lance again, um, you can see that through there uh, the bottom x-axis is sort of the day of the year. And so you can see throughout the year, different life stages, different life stages are doing different things and using the, the sandy floor in different ways. Um, and so, you know, depending on the vulnerability of a given life stage, you can kind of see how that timing of a dredge project might affect a different life stage. Or you can just simply see that that um, big arch indicated by bottom time, um, that that increases dramatically at a certain time of year. So if dredging projects are occurring, then there could be a bigger impact um, for that particular time period. And then, um, so now that we've sort of kind of gathered that data on um, how fish and animals occur on the shoal, like I said, we've also been able to um, study the response to dredging. So I'm gonna cover a couple of those mm -hmm. generic, um, uh, not generic, but just try to uh, compile some of those findings for you here. Um, so the removal, the removal of sediment changes the shape of the seafloor. Um, now the subsequent water movement tends to smooth those edges and there is some infilling. However, that infilling rate is incredibly variable depending on where you are. It can depend on sediment sources, on the um, hydrodynamics, um, you know, very, very different things can um, influence that. And in many areas, the infilling rate just does not simply keep up with the rate of depletion for dredge projects. Um, so that is maybe one thing that does not fully recover in every area. Um, but as far as the um, sort of uh, changes to the biological community, um, if the sediment is the same, so the, the sediment that's left behind is the same as what it was before dredging, uh, we do see that the same kind of colonies will be attracted there. Um, and so we'll see kind of recovery, a peak in biomass in three to six months, and then that um, biodiversity or composition after, you know, one to two years, um, or it can be longer if it is a um, kind of slow growing or highly mature uh, community. If the sediment is different, as we said in the very beginning, the type of sediment can um, determine the type of biological organism settling there. So if the sediment changes, then often the community may shift um, to a, to a different kind of um, community. And now looking at, um, at the Terrebonne example, so off of the coast of Louisiana, um, there was a dredge, uh, dredge event at Terrebonne, which is that middle row in the figure there. Um, and so the red dash line indicates when dredging occurred. So you can see um, the pie chart that shows the pre-dredge state, and then you can kind of see the monitoring that's occurred after that dredge event. And so for the Terrebonne um, project, the kind of large bodied amphipods are depleted and you see an influx of polychaetes, which is a very fast growing, um, quick to colonize animal. And so that kind of follows the pattern we might expect to see. And it continues for you know, over a year after dredging. And the Caminata and reference sites, they kind of, so they did not experience dredging, but you can still see that there's actually a, a good deal of natural variation in their communities. So having those kind of, provides that context in which to interpret the impacts of dredging to the Terrebonne site. And this project is ongoing. Um, and so this is something that we're continuing to explore and learn more about. And then going kind of from the benthic to the fish here, we're gonna look at the fish response to dredging. So um, 
again, off of Canaveral Shoals, we were able to uh, look at fish that were tagged and kind of how they moved um, and how they kind of responded to um, two different dredge events in 2014 and 2018. Um, so before dredging, kind of normal activity, uh, then there was decreased um, fish detections during dredging, which could signal avoidance. And then several weeks after dredging completed, um, those fish returned. And then outside of this, these particular, um, you know, dredge events, the community composition of the fish uh, was the same, um, whether it was in a dredged area or a non-dredged area. And then in Sandbridge Shoal, which is off of Virginia, um, two months after dredging, again, this was an opportunistic study. Mm -hmm. There were um, multiple species that did not show any difference, um, depending on whether it was a dredged or non-dredged site. And then there were two species, one that preferred the dredge site, one that preferred the non-dredge site. So there obviously is some variability in um, sort of species specific responses as well. So summarizing all this kind of once again um, in the next slide is that um, you know, through, through several different studies and several different approaches, we um, are tending to see that oceanographic factors, um, again, sort of temperature, stratification, those type of influences, um, may affect the fish distribution more than our kind of shoal or sand features. Um, however, the shoals and the troughs may be important as a complex together, not one on their own, but actually um, as a pair or as a um, system. Um, and we might have, um, you know, dredging may, might mimic the natural perturbations like storms and hurricanes, but we really need to also pay attention to the timing duration and mechanisms that are um, that are part of these, you know, these sort of different but uh, maybe related dis um, disturbances. Uh, seasonal migrations and annual patterns um, are becoming apparent. I think we have to be careful with this because as um, climate change affects species, communities, um, we do need to be able to stay agile and very critical about the information that we're using. Um, and this is something that we, we kind of have in mind. Um, to, to, to you know, need to factor into our assessments and our um, impacts. Um, there may be certain species, life stages, um, or groups of species that are more vulnerable to the impacts of dredging. That could be because of life history, it could be because of their prey type or specialization. Um, but, but by and large for the studies that have had, um, you know, the, the few studies that have had longer term data sets, uh, we have not, uh, seen a lot of long-term cumulative impacts to the sort of fish community and benthic communities. Um, but I will say that the depletion of sand resources is the one thing that um, is that sort of physical resource is not recovering to the sort of pre-dredge rate just because of infilling is often insufficient to actually um, replace that in a one-to-one -one ratio. And then to talk about kind of how we are taking the science out of our studies process and putting it into our decisions and applications. Um, on the next slide, we can see that um, the way that it's being uh, integrated can be both at the BOEM level and kind of on the, by our external partners. So some of our practices that are integrated either into lease language or um, other mitigations um, is to maintain the sediment characteristics. So again, after you dredge, the underlying sediment that's still there um, should match what was um, dredged out. And then also limiting dredge depths in anoxia prone environments. We do have um, external mitigations that come from resource management agencies, again, like NOAA Fisheries. Um, and they have often used foam science uh, for their uh, mitigation to develop some of their mitigations. And so sometimes we'll see things like maintaining shoal integrity um, monitoring projects for benthos and fishes and minimizing um, harassment and take of protected species, of course. Then next slide. So um, kind of to give you a glimpse into where we're headed since we've now just looked back at where we've been, um, a lot of what we wanna do is um, kind of launching off of what we've learned so far. Obviously, as we're learning more, we're discovering where we kind of have some more place, you know, places to um, continue our research. Um, and so we want to sort of reflect on our last kind of 10 to 15 years and kind of prepare ourselves for, um, for kind of what's to come. Um, and so we do have a lot of ideas from our partners, um, 
and as well as our um, you know, ongoing studies themselves often will point to gaps and new, new areas of research that we need to consider. Um, so I, this is the kind of end of my session. Um, we can kind of pause and just do quick questions on the content. And then I do have those sort of primer questions that we can um, jump to uh, for discussion. Well, I imagine there are a lot of questions. I, I certainly have a few. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you very, very much. So to the, <clears throat> I, I, if I could, I'll jump in with it, with your shoals, your discussion, you're, you're talking about uh, the, 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 the importance of them. Um, so, so I guess, well, one question is you're, you're using just the, the marine fishery service trawl data. Is that what you're using to, in, in that analysis you were talking about? For one particular study, yes, we did use the Northeast Fishery Science Center um, trawl survey data in the New York Bite, and so that was um, what we. So that project started kind of had two phases. It started as a data review, um, and so for that we looked. We included state data as well and some shellfish data um, from the state, and then the Northeast Fishery Science Center was the most robust um, data set for that for our area of interest. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to analyze that uh, relative to shoal features that Boehm had um, modeled in a different study. So we we're able to integrate kind of our results in two different ways. Um, and so that's where we were able to kind of look at, um, you know, and then we, you know, in incorporated data sets on environmental factors as well. And so that's kind of why we were able to look at um, influences on distribution uh, for fish in that kind of bigger footprint. And, and the, 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 like, are you, are, are shoals kind of a target or are they more of a, they're more of an easy, uh, easy place to mine? Is that what, so you'd be like smoothing the shoals out? Well, it's, yeah. So shoals tend to have a higher, you know, a high volume of sand um, so that they, they may be targeted, not always, um, but they may be um, kind of a low hanging fruit to target uh, for dredge projects. I see. Yeah. So that's why we sort of had a, and, and NOAA fisheries in our consultations had kind of pointed out, um, you know, that shoals may be important fish habitat. Um, and so that's kind of where, where we kind of were led down this trajectory of defining um, habitat, particularly thinking about whether shoals kind of themselves as a feature played an, a role in um, kind of how fish were distributing. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I know that, I mean, for example, in the, in the mid-Atlantic there, in, in the area you showed, the elephant trunk is a, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it's a large shoal that looks, oddly enough, like an elephant trunk. And, uh, but that's a really, um, uh, you know, a, a critical place for, for recruitment, for example, for, for scallops. They seem, and, and part of the reason I, I think they do that anyway is because the shoal brings this, the, the scallops, uh, or brings the, the, the seafloor up into a, a colder water stream into the uh, Labrador current, the, the kind of um, the cold water wedge that goes down there. And so it's more favorable for, for, for scallops and there's actually a, a, an inversion of the heat. So I think that, you know, linking it to the oceanographic, uh, can do, I mean, with all shoals, it's all a combination of upwelling and that's, that's why they're so productive. So yeah, really linking it in with the oceanography or the benthic oceanography, right. be pretty, Pretty important. Um, I had one other thing, but I'll let some other people take a take a shot first. Go. Yeah. Just, first of all, it's great. I mean, the way you pulled everything together. Um, there is one thing that might be interesting to look at at some point. Fish distributions, when you look at it as a snapshot, you know this can be really altered by the instantaneous distribution of food. So like if you have a bloom of capitellid worms, it's gonna mask any, any habitat preferences if, if the fish are eating the worms. On the other hand, the other thing we don't pick up with snapshots is lag effects. So like mature bottom could generate greater recruitment success in certain bivalves and crabs, but that won't show up until down the road. So, I mean, there's an argument for you to do repeated, I'm sure you love this, but to, to, to do, you know, at least multiple seasons. So that, uh, and if we, could we put up my last slide? Um, 
Zoe, if that's possible, because I had a couple of sort of discussion questions. So, and this is, you know, you're leading right into that because one of the one of the questions that came to mind um, that's actually not even on here, it just came from our discussion this morning. Um, but how, you know, we've, so we've invested in, in um, you know, various methods, but kind of the same objective of um, kind of those ecological um, studies. And they, they are, uh, even if we do seasonality, there is of course, a um, you know, <laughs> even if you go at once a month, you're still getting that snapshot effect. Um, so one of the things that, it, I'm wondering is like when at what point do you sort of pause your current methods or approach or or do you sort of start ooh, start integrating um, new methods and so for example we aren't detecting a lot of long-term cumulative impacts but maybe that's the detection problem and it's not um, so it's like do we invest in sort of that really high intensity frequency or um, you know kind of alter the methods so that we can maybe increase our chance of detecting um, instead of doing these more wide ranging um, kind of ecological questions. So it's, it's, a, tr it's a financial trade off, right? <laughs> One of the things I'd, I'd suggest you guys take a look at is link up with um, the Habitat uh, Committee uh, with the uh, New England Fisheries Management Council or some of the other councils. I mean, that they've been working on. Uh, uh, what's they, they call it the, a, a SASE model, but it's a it's a space um, model that looks at it, it links in the the oceanography, it looks in it links into the, the the benthic structure and the amount of natural disturbance on the seafloor and compares it to different types of fishing gear and 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 uh, the disturbance from from fishing in these areas and the whole coast is modeled with these and, and they've got two or three iterations of it now, so it might really uh, help in your analysis of this because they've also included a, 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 a large range of species from both the, uh, um, the, the mid-Atlantic and around New England. So you, you might want to take a look at their, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty wealthy data set. And I think they're doing their, I mean, that's, they've been working on it for o over 20 years now. So the, the, the models are pretty, pretty refined. Mm -hmm. So I can ask another question. Um, thank you. That was an interesting discussion, an interesting follow-up. Do you think we're, are we pretty good at, since, since actually sand replacement by natural processes seems like it's one of the most important determinants of, of, uh, of how quickly the sand shoals repopulate, are we pretty good at predicting where the sand infills um, more quickly and where it doesn't? Um, do any of my geologists want to take that? <laughs> um, I'd say it, it seems to vary project by project. Because a lot of times um, what we, at least from, from, again, a biologist point of view, from what I know we've done, is we'll look at um, bathymetric surveys from after the last dredge project to before the next dredge project and find the increase. Um, and so that's a way that we can do it that is dependent on data quality. We've had some issues with um, our Bathy surveys not being up to par. Uh, so we, and we've worked that out. So we have better kind of um, quality control for those. Um, so that is kind of the easiest way for us to estimate infilling rates. We have done some studies, environmental studies to look at um, specific sites in filling rates, um, but that's hard to extrapolate site to site. Dina, this is Jeff Weichel. I'll jump in okay, on this great. topic too. A uh, very good question. Um, and I would remind everyone that we're generally in shallow water. So sometimes 20, 20 to 30 meters water depth. And so in um, good parts of the year, there's not even stratification. Uh, so there's a lot of mixing. Um, um, uh, some of these features, the, the crest that gets dredged is as shallow as 10 meters. Um, so very physically dominated environments. And um, the shoals themselves are constantly migrating. Uh, so in a place like an Atlantic, um, where it's a sand rich environment, say the mid-Atlantic, one of the most uh, dense sand ridges in the world, um, these features themselves are naturally um, evolving. And so you can think of, there's not an active sediment supply coming from terrestrial sources that's rebuilding them. 
but alongshore and crossshore processes are constantly evolving them. And so in many cases, when there's a positive relief feature, we're deflating it or elongating it. Um, you can compare that to a place in the Gulf of Mexico where you have ship shoal, that's an enormous feature and they're creating little depressions in it. Uh, and otherwise what's a positive relief feature. And those depressions fill in with modern uh, sediments coming from the uh, Atchafalaya or the Mississippi, and it is changing the sediment composition and even the inherent um, bottom boundary layer dynamics within the footprint of the depression that was that was dredged. But largely, uh, we consider these resources to be um, finite and non-renewable on their use scales. Let me, <clears throat> I just want to add to what Jeff said, uh, Paul Nor. So the Atlantic specifically, uh, sand isn't really a renewable resource in the sense that most of the rivers have been dammed. So they're preventing additional sediment load coming in. So really when a, when a shoal feature rebuilds itself, it's just reaching a new equilibrium uh, with the reduced amount of sediment that is present. Um, so if sand's being added, it's being re removed from somewhere else on the shelf. Uh, there isn't some you know magical source of sand beyond the rivers, which aren't providing sand anymore. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I was just curious how much of the natural variability there is. And you, you sort of just answered that. This completely different topic than I ever think about. So this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I, so, I mean, I think of things like gray whales bioturbating, and that's where my mind thinks instead of what you guys are doing. But I, I guess the question was, how well do we know the natural variability and how that affects these ecosystems? It sounds like you started to, <laughs> to address that point. Yeah, I think uh, one of the major things we've encountered in the Northeast, we could survey for, and that's mobile versus immobile sands, where the mobile sands are basically the ones, the immobile sands, sorry, are basically the ones with very mature communities of two builders and stuff like that to stabilize it. Those have the highest biodiversity and fishery value. And if, if we could like overnight know where they are, that would help a lot. And we, we dealt with that with the HAPCs. Except I think we did it right. Yes. <laughs> For me, just one of these things, and one of the one of the contra contradict. Well, it's a, it's a little contradictory. So so in the in the in the realm of, of fishery science, and and habitat disturbance, you're you know there, there's there's multiple studies showing that that fisheries disturb the seafloor, and that's so so then in your conclusion here that that dredging the the, the community rebuilds pretty quickly and i realize it's a sand sand environment but it seems a little counterintuitive two different sources of, of data or, 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 or scientific thinking about it but, mm. yeah. i i think um you know the spatial footprint is uh perhaps more uh intensely disturbed but more contained more you know the the actual footprint is very specific um whereas with some fisheries it, it might be more widespread across larger areas of the shelf um and it's again the duration is um also very uh you know fast fast and furious where it's for a couple months usually that the dredging happens and then it's over usually for several years and so um you know the the sense of recovery again it that that pattern looks different there's a sort of rebound again with the thing about the benthic infauna there's a rebound in biomass quickly but not to the full community for a couple years and so um and then so thinking about how that might affect fish i mean again our our studies have not um identified change like a you know if you go to an area um say off of sandbridge virginia um there's a shoal there that has been dredged many times, I think we're up to eight or nine times over decades. Um, but the most recent benthic and fauna survey show that it's the same composition as a control uh, completely undredged site. So that's that's sort of what those results are, are suggesting. Um, 
And it, you know, again, I think the, so when we go a couple levels up the trophic ladder and think about the fish that are feeding on the, the, you know, benthic in fauna, it may, it may depend whether their specialization or they don't mind if they eat a polychaete today and an amphipod tomorrow. So, um, you know, I think some of those questions, that specialization question is something that we could use to hone in on certain species or guilds being more impacted. Um, but that's sort of my best guess as far as the, the um, difference in sort of the fisheries um, kind of for, uh, impacts versus like sort of dredging, just the, the type of activity. I think there's a little bit of difference that might account for it. Is this Karen Ashton? Actually, this question is pretty much almost answered by you, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I was wondering how big an area is that dredging and then how have you looked to see if there's any change in the, say the recovery time, depending on the area that you dredged. And that kind of goes into the fishing things. The fishing area is so much greater probably than the dredging area. And it seems that the impact is much longer lasting for the, but I didn't know if you had done any of that with your studies. Uh, I'm writing this down real quick. Um, <laughs> um, so the area of a, so we usually lease an area of I'm going to just approximate here one to two nautical miles by two to three nautical miles. That's usually sort of generally speaking, um, a lease area. Dredging usually happens in a smaller area than that. Um, we have seen mitigation measures that require um, sort of uh, patches, refuge patches, so that recolonization can happen uh, more quickly. Um, we don't see that it's not across the board. We don't see that for every project. Um, a lot of times that does tend to happen just because the way the dredges move, they, the hopper dredges do not do like a clean cut, like mowing the lawn. A lot of times it's squiggly lines and there's sort of those kind of furrows are left behind naturally. Um, so I think that could potentially recolonize. Uh, we do have a, a study that's currently on our um, national studies list and, and funded that is um, going to look at the intensity of dredging and how that might affect recovery time. So I think that could potentially get to that second part of the question. And Karen, this Megan Carl, just add a point of clarification. Just because we are leasing an area doesn't mean that the entirety of the area is authorized to be dredged. So we're actually authorizing certain volume of, of material to be removed in a much larger area to make sure that people are paying attention and we're able to do those mitigation measures. Yeah, I was looking back, you know, she's, we saw a lot of data about recovery and stuff. And I was just wondering if, if embedded in there was any information on how big the dredge area, not the lease area had been and whether there was any trend towards right. a different recovery time. I, I find it fits right in with the fish thing because the fish thing could be so much greater. Yeah, I think that that, jet, that overall sort of intensity or footprint um, is is certainly a factor that we would, um, oh, that we're pl we plan to look at in this current study. Um, the issue that I'm encountering right now is that we don't have data sets for every project. So even if it was a huge footprint, we might not have that actual field data to tell us what happened. And so that's what the, the study is aiming to use the data we do have and kind of model um, what we can out of it. So, yes. Oh, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's, of course, you know, you just said it, you don't necessarily have data for every location or whatever. But while I think you're, you're right that we can make certain generalizations about the effects of shoals and things like this, you, you do need to, and that goes a little bit back to what Les was saying, um, that you do need to consider sort of who the organisms actually are. And, you know, one, one thing is mobile versus, versus um, um, sessile, but the other one is sort of their reproductive potential for instance, and if you have very slow um, reproducing organisms versus, and I mean, that's the person from the Arctic, right? <laughs> it can be a, a big thing um, versus you have maybe something that are you know fast and furious in terms of, of uh, reproduction. So I think it is important to also consider every location in terms of the biological aspects. You, you mentioned in your presentation that you had had some problems with your before after control impact design, but you've, could you explain a little more on what the, what the problem was and how you, how you fixed it? 
So the yeah, so the sort of logistics of a um, before after study uh, can be tricky. So um, dredging projects are you you know they might be funded by a local um, kind of county or town, uh, but it usually it's usually tied to some sort of federal funding, or it might be 100% federally funded, which means Congress is approving it. Um, so we often see delays um, or that the timing is not what they expect. Maybe they thought they would be able to dredge in spring, but they don't get the money until the fall. Or um, there's just, there just tends to be this sort of flexibility in the project that does not lend itself to <laughs> environmental studies. Um, like for example, off of New Jersey, we're, we're trying to study fine scale fish movement, or we are studying fine scale fish movement on a sand shoal. Um, you know, we thought that there was going to be a dredge project kind of part way through so that we could look at post dredge um, behavior, which is something that we really haven't been able to do before. Lo and behold, you know, that dredge project is sort of indefinitely on hold. So, you know, we're, I'm sort of like, well, we can come back to it in a couple of years, but it's just, it just makes it logistically difficult. Or if it's an emergency lease, um, if something, a hurricane comes through and they need to uh, re renourish a beach within, you know, eight months to a year, um, we don't always have the agility to execute the, both the funding and just the field work that would be associated with sort of a before dredge um, monitoring. That, that's uh, so, uh, just one, one second there. That, that's funny though, because I, I thought you were going to say it was selecting the control areas. That seems to be the biggest challenge for what with the wind farm siting that we're we, running we into. have also so um our uh study off of canaveral shoals um on east central florida has probably our most comprehensive um research to date on this sort of topic and we not only had we had our dredge site we also had three control shoals to compare to and um that was very helpful but it's very expensive um but but yeah like having the control site trying to find something that's comparable ideally you'd have more than one because having three gave us a much better picture about what's happening in that kind of broader system and not just you know if we were one to one we would we would have thought something was way off with the the you know one site or the other but having three it puts it all into a much better context yeah just real quick comment um somebody mentioned cost and distance before so adding one mile of distance to a dredge plan. So moving the shoal by one mile, for instance, adds about, and this is numbers from about six years ago, adds about a dollar per cubic yard of sand. So if you have 2 million cubic yards of sand for your project and you move the, the dredge out one mile further, you've just added, what, $2 million to your project um, or 4 million, depending. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's easy to say, well, can't you just go dredge somewhere else? But you're you're drastically potentially increasing the cost when you do that in a very fun, constrained environment. Yeah, this is Katrina again. again. Just maybe you said it and I missed it, but what are the parameters you're using to actually um, choose your control sites basically? I, yeah, it's it's all obviously very site specific. Um, so we and not every project has um, a control site. It sort of depends on how much funding there is. Sometimes it's purely just a before and after. Um, but it's yeah, there. I'd say it's it's very site specific, and we've only been able to to do a control site in a few small instances. Um, so yeah, I'd have to get back to you on on the specifics for those projects. Do you have something or is there? You had your card up and then you put it down. I'm curious, completely different, it's sort of a different question. How often the po pollution in that, in that dread site, and I'm thinking like Southern California bite, we don't want to touch because the DDT is sequestered. And San Francisco Bay, which is out of your, out of your area is also heavily polluted. So you, you're not allowed to dredge or, or the offal is is a and toxic, but I'm thinking you know in, in the Gulf there may be the the deep, deep horizon oil spill is creating lenses of 
of uh, you know oil pollution in the in the in the sands. How I mean, somehow you must be dealing with those. I, if anybody from the Gulf could, yeah, that that's a good question for my colleague. Yeah, very good question. For at least the sites that we've worked on since Deepwater Horizon, um, typically the evaluation of the quality of the sediments or what might be disturbed and suspended happens as part of the planning process for the design of the borrow area, right? So all the chemical testing and that kind of thing happens in advance. I, at this point, I don't think we've seen, at least in the Gulf, a whole lot of, like there's nothing that I know of that's been flagged as um, a contaminated site essentially. So we've for the most part avoided that. I know that it has come up recently with a project that's coming up in Texas where EPA was interested in potentially having some sediment testing done. But I know the core as part of their standard processes incorporates testing and that sort of thing prior to any dredging that ever happens, particularly in cases when you're talking about restoration of an area, right? You know, <laughs> not necessarily want to move contaminated materials to the beach. <laughs> Yeah, I figured that. I, I was involved in the Exxon Valdez uh, damage assessment. And for years afterwards, you could dig on the beaches a little bit and you'd get this lens of, of tarry material. So, I, But that's also a cold water environment compared to the Gulf. Maybe I was curious, um, coming back to restore and some of those activities, how much opportunity is there through the re various restore programs to, to do more of the work and how is BOEM leveraging, say, cross-pollination of ideas, um, maybe not so oil-related, direct oil-related, but <clears throat> answer more of the ecosystem questions that then would inform future restoration. Yeah, um, good question. So um, Restore has um, been working with us in, in the Gulf. I'm sorry, this is Jessica Malandine speaking. Um, that's sorry, the Restore Act is, is different. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> there's um, trustee implementation groups and funding out of the Restore Act post Deepwater Horizon penalty funds that are funding huge programs across um, the Gulf of Mexico in, in short forms. Yeah. Right, yeah, so they, um, we have gotten funds through that program. The funds that we've been provided so far have been predominantly at this point for all five states to look at data archives. So there's a lot of digitization of historical data that's been going into almost exclusively into the development of MMIS that built out the backbone of a lot of the data in MMIS, but it was it was driven more by the geologic geophysical data that was available. Um, as far as proposals that have come up in recent years, there's not as much interest in this type of research, at least with BOEM, because it seems to be they're really focused on on ground projects at this point. And I could be completely yeah. off base, at least with the groups that we're working with right now. Um, they're really interested in you know, the states want to see what can be built and what can be built now, what can be visible. And some of this research is a little harder to show progress on because it's not visible, right? You know, it's data that's available and accessible. Mm -hmm. But that's just my experience from the groups with Restore that we've been working with. It may be different for others. Yeah, I was curious, maybe less the states, but more some of the like open ocean benthic habitat, like some of the shoaling work and the response and the, the backy work would seem legitimate uses of those funds, particularly because those funds can contribute to knowledge for future things, should those happen. So that's what I was curious on why maybe it wouldn't be picked up through more of the ocean coastal related pieces, but okay. It was just a question, not a, thanks. Um, I was just wondering if it would be too brave to, or is there a geomorphologist brave enough to take your atlas and make it breathe, make it dynamic so that 
we can use um, like the dynamics of the system as a criterion for where it might be best to mine. I even I don't even know if one millimeter sands, which is usually what we're looking for, are biologically as important as fines or the coarser stuff which you need for aggregate. Yeah, uh, yeah. Our um, you know the shoal the sort of shoal classification modeling that we did that um, you know we have this layer now that is um, housed on both MMIS but also the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. Um, and so it, we have, and we have now integrated it into other studies, uh, but that was just a jumping off point. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity and even the renewable energy program wants to take, you know, apply that same concept to deeper water. We were only able to go to 40 meters, um, and, but we, you know, we, we used existing um, data that already, you know, so we it didn't require any new collection, um, but I think, you know, the data gets um, sparser with the farther offshore you get. But it, this sort of uh, ability to kind of classify these shoal features is something that the Renewable Energy Program is interested in for the same kind of reasons of NOAA Fisheries pointing to that saying, you know, we don't fully understand this value of this type of habitat, but we haven't gone so far as to whittle down that, that sort of class to what is actually overlaid with, you know, feasible sediment size, grain size and um, color and um, kind of the operational side of things. So it could certainly be refined further. Yeah, because it's a little like, imagine if oil migrated and you kind of want to keep track of where it was. Yeah. So on, on schedule, I, I don't want to interrupt the discussion because it's a great discussion. I know there's more to go. And I, I would say we, we have not answered the questions, but it is a... a, a, a time for well on the schedule it's time for a break do you want to take that coffee break for five minutes or 10 minutes and stretch and then come back and try and focus our thoughts to focus in on these questions uh, i mean we can and we can pivot and go to um anna's presentation and then we can even combine our kind of questions I, you know these were just sort of things to offer up if if needed um but we can maybe combine them with our other set of questions at the end Oh, it, it's, it's up to the group, what, I, you know. Yeah, that would be fine. Um, I, I think the questions are, are quite quite interesting. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear people. I, I have my own views, but I, but let's so let's take a let's uh, let's take our, our, our a bit quick break. Everyone can stretch and kind of focus in and then we'll uh, we'll uh, come back and uh, follow up. OK, great. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we're gonna we're gonna jump back in for the last uh, last uh, session here, which is somewhat of a continuation uh, of what we were talking about, but uh, kind of pulling it all together. So I'll hand it over to to Anna. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, just to kind of recap, uh, Dina's section that like you just heard, she focused on the ecological value. She gave a lot of examples of ongoing research. Um, and now uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about research stewardship in multi-use planning. Um, so this is more of like a forward thinking approach. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, some, I'm gonna highlight some studies uh, that deal more with like ecological, economical factors or economical drivers, because we think that those are important uh, for uh, multi-use planning. We think that multi-use planning will dictate our future research uh, for decision-making. So again, more forward thinking. Um, approach for this part of the presentation. Next slide. All right, so similar to Dina, I've structured this slide um, with kind of some bullets that some, you know, takeaways or concepts that I will be covering uh, in this part of the presentation. And then like Dina, we also, uh, also have some questions uh, that we will be asking. So we will be doing a kind of combined discussion with her section and my section um, at the end of the presentation. All right, so for multi-use planning, economic drivers uh, we think may hold uh, greater weight in decisions than ecological factors. So that's um, up for debate, but that's just uh, where we're headed most likely. Um, uh, we'll cover uh, 
the, the concepts of how the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic regions use different designations to characterize the availability and usability of a sediment resource. Um, and then we'll also kind of take a deeper dive into the infrastructure buffers, uh, which were we touched upon, Jessica already touched upon this in the MMP 101, but I'll kind of provide more context for that. Um, and they play a significant uh, role in determining the resource availability. So uh, again, uh, the questions that we'd like to ask at the end of this presentation is how do we conserve sediment resources if there is a high uncertainty in the value of demand? And then what information would be useful to aid multi-use decisions? And then that last question, you'll probably recognize it. That's the first question that I posed at the very beginning when I gave the kind of introductory slide. And it's, it's our overarching question that combines kind of uh, both Dina's and, and, and my sections for this presentation. Okay, next slide. All right, so I'd like to start off with um, a, a study. That, this is an ESP funded study from a few years ago that touched on uh, economic factors. So this was a study that was conducted uh, for the Gulf of Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico. The title of it was Economic and Geomorphic Comparison of Outer Continental Shelf Sand and Near Shore Sand for Coastal Restoration Projects. So it focused on developing a couple of geomorph geomorphic and economic framework uh, to assess whether to use near shore sediment or outer continental shelf sediment uh, for dedicated dredgings in coastal Louisiana. So it was very much focused in, in Louisiana. Um, and just to kind of uh, give the general conclusion was that, of course, uh, using sediment from the OCS comes at a higher cost, um, but there can be an offset uh, in those e economic uh, factors in certain cases because there's uh, OCS uh, source uh, sediment has uh, reduced handling losses uh, uh, from, from fines that appear in near shore, um, uh, for near shore uh, resources. Um, and also OCS sediment or sand usually has increased resilience uh, because the diameter of the sands are larger. All right, next slide. All right, so now let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about how uh, in the Gulf and the Atlantic, we designate uh, what we call sediment resource areas. So significant sediment resource areas, that's how we define them in, um, in the Gulf, SSRAs. So you probably saw, and we'll revisit later uh, in the MMP uh, 101 presentation, there was a kind of a multi-use planning uh, for the Gulf of Mexico slide, uh, where those significant uh, sediment resource area blocks uh, were designated. And you see them here on the right again. So uh, MMP evaluates data collected with uh, public and private partners to determine areas of uh, significant reserves of surface and solid, shallow subsurface uh, mineral deposits. Uh, so we use uh, all types of data, including industry data. Um, the SSRAs, um, just because we uh, an SSRA is designated doesn't mean that there's actual significant sediment in the area, which is it's just the potential for significant uh, sediment. Um, and one uh, thing that we need to mention here is that SSRA blocks do not designate a no activity area for oil and gas, offshore wind, or carbon capture storage. You know, we need to work with our partners um, to, you know, manage, manage the, the multi-use issue. So there to the right um, uh, shows you uh, the, our latest update of SSRA. So we don't usually update uh, these uh, SSRA areas in the Gulf every year, but maybe every few years, we kind of take a look back at the data. Uh, sometimes we add resource blocks, sometimes we take them away, depending on whether, you know, maybe we have uh, more updated uh, uh, data in that specific OCS block. Um, and we determine that, well, you know, we can kind of take that uh, one away for, you know, and not designate it as an SSRA. Sometimes there's a lot of infrastructures you will see. So it'd be impossible to dredge that specific block. Uh, one thing that I'll note for the Gulf is that our state partners are very much involved in the process of designating um, SSRAs. Uh, they have been uh, from the very beginning. And this is kind of in contrast to the Atlantic. Next slide. So the Atlantic, um, for the Atlantic are, uh, the significant uh, resource areas are uh, called uh, sand aliquot blocks. Uh, these are um, a lot smaller. They're about 1 16th of the OCS protraction grid block. Um, should have mentioned that each OCS block uh, is 4,800 by 4,800 meters. So these sand aliquots are a lot, lot smaller. Um, and for uh, the sand aliquots to be designated as as, as such, they have to be uh, within one statute mile buffer of where OCS sand resources have been identified through uh, reconnaissance uh, and under the design level studies. 
So one main difference is that um, kind of MMIS or the data that's included in, in MMIS of, for significant, significant sediment kind of dictates um, when we um, designate an aliquot. So if the data is not in MMIS, we don't have an, uh, an aliquot designation. In contrast to the Gulf, uh, the state partners don't usually have a, an opinion or say in, in, in what uh, sand aliquots have been designated. All right, next. All right, so we saw this uh, same figure in the MMP 101, as Jessica presented it. So I'm not gonna go over um, everything that's going on here. Um, but now you know uh, about SSRAs, those are uh, labeled in, in gray as um, Jessica alluded to uh, later. But the one thing that I wanna uh, mention here or kind of tee up to the next few slides is uh, the impact of buffers in our infrastructure. So for particularly for the Gulf, as Jessica mentioned, um, there's a lot of uh, oil and gas infrastructure uh, for wells, which are designated like as the blue uh, dots. There is a 500, uh, foot a buffer around each of the of the of the wells, and then for um, for pipelines, there is a thousand foot buffer on each side of the pipeline. So of course you don't want to dredge too close to the pipeline, right? Because that would be dangerous. So we have these buffers, but that the buffers actually heavily impact uh, the usability or the dredging uh, of, of 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 the resource areas. So next slide. So going back, if you remember to the trick question that Jessica asked in the MMP 101 this morning, uh, that the right answer was 38.7 million. That's a kind of the economical value uh, that is associated with 1000 meter pipeline um, going right through one of our SSRAs. So this kind of gives you insight onto how that um, number, how uh, CPRA in this case came up with that number. Uh, this is a very specific example, it's just for Louisiana, but you see there that for a thousand meter pipeline, you have a you have a 300 meters or a thousand feet on each side uh, of buffer. Uh, that pipeline will occupy um, 600 square meters of significant uh, sediment resource area because it goes right through it. Um, so it, it will prevent the access um, of about 1.8 million cubic um, million, uh, 2.4 million cubic yards of sediment, assuming a three meter uh, thickness. Um, C. Perry came up with an average economic value of sediment of $21 per meter cube. So if you multiply that by the square, uh, 600 square meters uh, that, it, that that pipeline will occupy, uh, that's how you get to the 37.8 million. So that's, that's a pretty high number. Now for context in the Gulf of Mexico, some of these pipelines that we deal with are five to six miles long. So you can, you know, you can do the math for yourself how much, uh, how much of an impact uh, pipelines, infrastructure, and then the buffers associated with the infrastructure uh, uh, is. All right, next slide. All right, this is just to kind of give you a visual. This is from one of our ongoing studies. Um, the Water Institute is uh, using a source to sink geologic framework approach uh, to find um, sediment resources. So uh, in Barataria Bay, uh, so this is in Louisiana, as you can see by the map there above. Um, and then what they did is they found these uh, significant sediment areas um, and there's volumes associated with those as you can see there on the left. And then they overlaid uh, the pipelines, um, including the buffers. Um, and as you can see, well, that uh, reduces the usability uh, of, of the, the material there by quite a bit. So you can see um, in the West Grand Tier, which is the example on the left, you go from 49 million cubic uh, meters of sand to 40 um, MCMs. Um, it gets even worse at Sandy Point. Um, and these, of course, numbers are conservative uh, because there's some areas to the left, for example, in Sandy Point, where you wouldn't be able to get a dredge in there because just, there's, just, yeah, there's just not enough room for a dredge to operate. All right, next slide. Let's move on uh, to the uh, an example of the Atlantic and let's move on to offshore wind and the impact of buffers for offshore wind cables. So the commission, the Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council recommends a 500 meters uh, of buffer for each uh, cable uh, in depths of up to 75 uh, meters. And this is actually a very interesting example to the right um, of, um, I think it was the Empire Wind uh, Project. 
So uh, originally, the uh, operator or the, the 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 Empire Wind wanted to uh, include the wanted to run that pipeline corridor designated in pink there in the figure, right along uh, the Anchorage um, area, which is depicted by that um, blue polygon there. Um, through conversations with uh, Boom, I think we were the ones that uh, had to tell them that you know they couldn't run it through there because it was an Anchorage. Um, area so they came back and they wanted to run the, the the cable corridor right through that shoal area which you can see you can see it has high thickness there in the middle so with negotiations with them we were able to um you know negotiate with them and they uh, ended up putting uh, the cable corridor in between you know as far south uh, close to the anchorage area but uh, further far, further north than that area of significant sediment. So that was, a, I guess, a win-win uh, for both parties. All right, next slide. And this is another uh, example of uh, impact analysis uh, for Empire Wind. Um, this is a very generalized impact analysis case study uh, for the New York Harbor. Uh, so this figure is a little bit deceiving. Uh, you know, you, you see some proposed cables. Um, the hot pink is where the, it intersects a significant um, sediment area, shoal area. Um, but obviously there's a lot more going on in this area than just those two cables. Um, it's a very complex uh, congested area with um, high multiple use area with a lot of telecom cables, disposal areas, navigation channels, and the bit. Um, I believe that for this example, we did not have, um, you know, very, um, a lot of data to work with. I think uh, for this specific example, we assumed a five meter thickness kind of all across the board, but you can kind of see there to the, the right um, that overall, if you kind of combine these three areas of intersection that you see in this, um, the total square uh, uh, five foot thickness volume uh, that would not be usable um, is uh, 16.5 there cube, million cubic yards. Next slide. All right, and then here to cap it off, I wanted to highlight uh, this uh, uh, recent um, study uh, that uh, I think comes into play very nicely here because it combines both the ecological and economical factors um, that we think will be, uh, could be very useful for multi-use, uh, you know, for, for, for making decisions for multi-use planning. So this study uh, used a multi-criteria decision analysis to evaluate and quantify technical, environmental, economic, and social factors uh, in the context uh, with potential management and monitoring measures. Um, so it was used uh, to create a reproducible planning uh, process um, and a way to uh, standardize way to compare bar area sites to each other within a certain topography um, and incorporated uh, operations, environmental and economical factors. So there you see the, the kind of the criteria tree with some of the factors that were, or I guess all the factors uh, that were used. And this is a case study for uh, Canaveral Shoals. Um, next slide, sorry. So Canaveral Shoals uh, was a study that we mentioned, that was mentioned earlier in the MMP uh, 101. So this is a bar area. So the tool kind of breaks up the, uh, the bar area and it assigns it a score. Uh, so for this particular case, um, yeah, for this particular case, um, uh, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Uh, Area C, as you see there, has the lowest future usability since it's farther uh, and has less material. Mm -hmm. And then all areas are good options, though the area E may be slightly better, as you can see by the score there highlighted in, in yellow, which incorporates uh, all the different factors. Next slide. All right, so this is the final slide where we go back to those original questions. Um, I believe now uh, Dina's questions are in the slide right after that. So we'll probably end here and we can either focus on these questions or go back to Dina's or however um, you'll want to take it from there. Thank so, you. Anna and Dina just thought if you could provide a little bit more context for folks in the room, the 16 point some odd million acre or cubic meters of the sediment that would have been compromised um, I think it was slide 29 that you had the map on there. Typically, what would you expect miles of shoreline restoration using that 16 million? 
Like, are we talking 20 miles, 30 miles? Like just for people to visualize it a little bit differently than just sheer volumes, because these are large numbers. Very large numbers. That's a really good question. Does anybody want to take a guess? Do you feel all of the MMP people con like trying to do mental math right now? <laughs> um, so I, I don't have an answer to the question, but what I can say is that that number varies widely based on how what the design of the beach profile is, because sometimes there's terraces, sometimes it's more eroded, less eroded, sometimes you're covering um, certain aspects. But does anyone have a ballpark from a recent project? Shannon's nodding. I'll take a, I'll take okay, a guess. Thank I, you. I'd say it's less than 25 miles. <laughs> Is that good enough? Jeff Reidenauer, boom. So John Jensen from the University of West Florida. I have a question. If you could go back a couple of slides, I'm just, it's just, uh, let's see that one. Yes. That the criteria tree, I just, um, was trying to get my head around it and I see sediment characteristics and all of these things and there are uh, brackets that come off of it and then there's stakeholder acceptability and community opinion and it just at least the way I look at the graphics it's just kind of hanging there in space um, so maybe you could help me understand that <laughs> in that graphic everything else seems to have a very you know it's, there seems to be a place for it but I don't Anna, I can I can take that one on. Sure. Um, Jeff Weichel from Bohm. So I think in, in this uh, framework, uh, these were things that were tried to quantify where you could use something that was directly um, measurable and give it a score. And I think in this figure, which this the report that goes along with this gets into this one topic a lot more, that's something that is hard to pin down to a single number, just because the stakeholder views are so complicated. So for example, if you were to ask um, uh, environmental justice uh, community, they may have one perspective. If you were talking about private homeowners, they may have another perspective. Uh, and so getting those into a uh, aggregate score was a little more complicated. So I, I, I gather that part, <laughs> it, but I'm just sort of pointing out that everything else seems actionable and I'm, I'm hearing not necessarily actionable here. I would say so not. I guess my question is is how how in fact if at all maybe we'll deal with that in other places does that fit into the to what you do and and, and, and your choices it just it just looks to me odd the way it's sort of hanging there in the air uh in this in the in this graphic and but anyway I'll, I'll sure uh, uh that's a great question and, and a terrific observation um and i would say that every project has a slightly different stakeholder group and stakeholder process um and so there is is a public um involvement process where people uh give input uh there are states and local communities other federal other federal agencies uh tribes uh state historic preservation officers that 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 feed into this and i think that uh, the framework um, that's implied here um, using multi-criteria decision analysis, those things move in tandem. Um, so the things that could have a suitability score gets quantified, but that gets fed into a process that's accompanied by more like a, of a social process. So there's a compromise, there's give and take. Um, and they are to be viewed not as replacements for one another, but as companions in a decision process. Um, I set aside tribes, which we have to address differently because they're sovereigns. I, I'm not sure why a lot of that valuation couldn't be done through, say, a choice experiment uh, where you, you create a demand curve, you provide various kinds of choices of various kinds of things. So I, I think you could put a, a value on it um, that it just doesn't have to just sit off at the side and be, be sort of just just perceptions and attitudes, but we can come up with economic values as well. Uh, that's a, a great point. And we've done like contingent uh, evaluation, uh, hedonic evaluation studies to look at different markets, willingness to pay, um, uh, environmental costs that may be things like bequest value, option value. Um, they're, they tend to be complicated because you have interesting communities that, um, have interests in these areas. Basically, you have a huge tourism um, 
market that influences perceptions of values that are short-term users, if you will, a short-term community um, in the area uh, where these projects occur. Uh, you have um, people, at least in the willingness to pay, pay surveys that we have attempted, um, not many of them, but we have attempted some, um, there is a lot of uh, perceived economic value in uh, preservation as in leaving the area undisturbed. All those can be incorporated into, uh, into an economic model and sure. into a, a state of preference survey. So I, I, I think those can be you can get them. It doesn't, you know, the, it takes some some work, and and the same thing with uh, you can do uh, travel cost studies, uh, and and again look at uh, place values on uh, on tourism uh, and the like, and you can look at uh, revealed preference studies, uh, like has been done with. Uh, uh, Block Island, where they've done both uh, revealed preference on, on housing studies, so looking at how housing values change, uh, and and they've done revealed preference on uh, Airbnb by looking at Block Island versus Martha's Vineyard, and, uh, and then so th there are ways to to do this. It takes careful design, uh, but th those values can be uh, again. They're, they're not necessarily, there's, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty and people don't understand what they mean and they don't mean always, um, but they're something that could be added to the decision tree. Yeah, um, and given that this whole thing is sort of a Sisyphean enterprise, you guys are doing a pretty good job. But my question is, um, as climate change advances, as storms become more severe, we're gonna start seeing a heterogeneous map of the coast of areas where it just isn't worth doing this anymore and areas where it is. Shouldn't we be like moving toward that map and giving people the honest dope? I'm not gonna argue with that. <laughs> That's a very good point. I'll add. So um, Jeff and I were at the American Shore Beach Preservation Association meetings there in D.C. last week for their coastal summit um, lobbying for various things. And um, that was one of the topics. It was several hours dedicated towards is these restoration projects. And when is it too much? You know, I think back to I grew up in Friendswood, Texas, for the most part, where, um, just before Tropical Storm Allison in 2001. There was an assessment in Friendswood was of the entire country, number three on insurance payouts due to flooding events. And so community gets flooded, homes washed out, they get money, they rebuild, they make them bigger, but they build in the same place. And it just compounds the problem over time over and over again. And so I think we're absolutely seeing that across our coast. You know, don't go up Highway 1 today. So, you know, it, there's things like that over and over again. And, you know, part of the supply and demand studies that we're doing is to help in that decision-making for the communities to make on their own, on what they think it's worth moving forward on for their own individual choices. Megan, if, if I could add to that, um, just a little bit of a Gulf perspective to a lot of the islands, particularly in the central Gulf that we are helping restore or sands from BOEM or, or from the federal waters are being used to restore um, are uninhabited and so far offshore, most of the public may not even be aware that they're there. Um, and we have a great example of, there was actually a video of it in the 101 of the Westville Headland that was um, specifically constructed to help buffer storm impacts, particularly from um, hurricane activity. And during construction of the project, it got hit three times direct hit and was wiped out completely at 80% construction. FEMA is now funding the rebuild of it again. Um, so for the Gulf, it's a little bit of a different perspective because it's not as obvious that it's there as a protection mechanism for the coastline. So trying to articulate that value um, to the communities is challenging, but really important. 
Um, and there's an argument to be made that maybe there's not value in it because there is an infrastructure and habitat or homes, you know, but there's definitely a correlation with reduction of, of storm impacts from these offshore islands. So that, that's another element to it that makes that conversation, at least from my perspective, much more difficult. Yeah, Dan Costa, a couple of come one of the <clears throat> somewhere I remember in the political statement, managed retreat is not an option, which I've always found interesting. And in California, we have the, not only the problem with coastal zone, but fire hazard. And of course, if you read the newspapers, insurance companies are exiting the state. Uh, but my the, the question I had is completely different. And that is, have you looked at you had this nice map that showed the distribution of, of assets, but it gets back to the Karen's question earlier, and that was, how big is the, the dredging? And that made me start thinking about, I think implicit in her question was, there may be a really big difference, and this could not, this could be even beyond an ecological impact, but is it better to do one strip that's long or take an area and completely denude it but leave it in a in one area, or have a lot of strips that are, you know, some distance apart. Is has there been much thought in terms of the spatial way that a dredging occurs, and and on this fine scale? Good question. I feel like that tees up well with the presentation that we'll be hearing tomorrow. Um, with coastal resiliency and and kind of the presenters there will take a more kind of regional. Sand, um, more like a basing scale approach where I think those, you know, that question would be a better fit to be answered in, in that regard. I, I think the, you know, that question has been asked and the prevailing um, advice we get from resource management agencies is that um, more shallow but broader footprint approach instead of sort of sacrificing one area and, and kind of um, especially in the Gulf versus Atlantic, um, anoxia can become a real problem if you're in, you know, digging these deep pits. Um, but so as of now, the prevailing idea is to do that sort of broader footprint, not as deep. Yeah, this is Katrina I can I just a clarification that that uh, tree that uh, critical tree or decision tree. Uh, is that used to define if this area is suitable for what is needed? Or is that a decision tree to look at the impacts that might happen when it is stretched? I think it's more the first. Yeah. So think yeah, if that's if that's the case, then being the biologist or one of the biologists, I wonder why there's no, it seems there's no biological information that goes into that decision. There, there is a sub, you know, a small subsection of, uh, I think it's generally stated as, you know, environmental impact or something mm. like that, where it would sort of be fit under. Okay. Um, and that the tree um, is still sort of a theoretical tool. We have not used it in any like decision making or planning. It's it's sort of something that was created. It's um, I think for what we were talking about today, um, uh, we wanted to kind of show an, a potential example of how um, resource stewardship and environmental concerns might fit together. Um, and so this is a study and um, Paul was the COR for this study. So I was glad he just waved his arm at me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, almost forgot I did this one. This is like, know, like 2018. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pass ago. up to Paul. So we worked with the Corps of Engineers, the Waterways Research Center and some risk management experts from the Corps up in Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, somewhere like that um, on this study. And this is just one branch. There are several other branches, including environment, economics, cultural values, all that stuff. So all those various weighted uh, values then feed into the suitability scores. It's not just the geology. Any other comments or I don't know that we've answered these questions, but it was certainly a good discussion. Uh, it's well, it's it's five to four, so I guess. 
on the agenda. That's my remarks. Thank you very much, Anna. That was great. And, and everyone. So, so I, <clears throat> my, my closing for now, I would just say to thank all the presenters today. It's great job. Fantastic. Uh, uh, science being presented and, and, and really a, a thoughtful discussion. I really appreciated the, the thoughtful op open exchange of ideas. So uh, we'll, uh, it, it sounds like tomorrow we're going to hear more about this, about coastal restoration and also about critical, the, the critical minerals. So it's, it's going to be action packed tomorrow as well. And uh, with that, Jonathan, do you have some housekeeping stuff or is that it? Um, sure, I can just say very quickly, first of all, yeah, thank you again to all of our uh, BOEM guests uh, that have come all the way here and everyone joining online. Uh, we'll look forward again to a, a great discussion tomorrow morning.